Good morning, everyone. Monday, September 21st, Strategic Planning Council Committee of the Whole. We have, uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order at 9.02 a.m. We have an agenda before us. Would some councillor care to approve? To move, we approve the agenda. Deputy Reeve Swanson, all in favor? Motion carries seven to zero. Adoption of the minutes. Item 3.1, Strategic Planning Council Committee of the Whole from June 15th, 2020. Any changes or additions to the minutes? Councillor Duncan moves to accept. All in favor? Motion carries seven to zero. Item 4.1, community field and track lighting. Matt. Good morning, Matt Martinson, Director of Agriculture and Community Services. Um, the Rocky Mountain House and District Minor Football Association have been planning track lighting for Curtis Field for several years. Um, once again this year, they, they have plans to submit a CFIP application in January, which requires a matching component. Um, if successful, um, their plan is to, to construct in 2021. So the CFIP application and the project would include the um, 60 LED high mass lights and um, other works to, to facilitate um, the illumination of Curtis Field. It's important to note that the uh, project will benefit multiple user groups, not just minor football, rugby, soccer, speed skating, and um, many individual community members who utilize the track for skating and running will benefit from the lighting in, in an extended uh, usage into the evening hours uh, particularly, um, which is of course a, a significant challenge to football which happens in the fall um, predominantly and, and um, that's been a, a big challenge for our, our football teams. But it'll, it'll certainly benefit a lot of other user groups um, that use the Curtis Field and the track. It is um, administration's understanding in discussions with the town that they will be including the um, track project in their capital priority presentation to their council. And if um, maybe I'll defer to Councillor Swanson if that's consistent with her understanding through her work with the rec board. Thank you. Um, so that concludes my presentation on the uh, community field and track lighting. Thank you. Deputy Reeve Swanson. Yeah, I would just like to add that um, now that the spray park is up and going and everything else, like it is the having everything well lit around that track is going to help maybe deter any vandalism, theft, that kind of thing during <laughs> the off season. So um, the, I know in the beginning when the football field or football club first applied, the questions did come as would those lights interfere with the helipad la landing at the hospital? Um, because that was a big concern because once the, I believe the arenas were done, there was a, an interference and that's why the helicopter, helicopters couldn't land at the, the hospital. So apparently that has been solved and that these lights will, will be uh, effective. But uh, again, um, it is also a, a form of safety and, and to help with um, the video camera and, you know, to help deter any of the vandalism at that track is, and the, those assets around the track as well. Councillor Lahid. I guess just a question then, um, with that lighting then, is, that, is this lighting going to be on all the time then, or is it intermittent when there's field use? It's my understanding that it's going to be intermittent when there's field use, but there'll be some components of it that could be utilized for extended periods of time, uh, such as potentially to illuminate the spray park and the track. So I, I believe they'll have, it, it's not an all or nothing type, it's not 60 lights or nothing, um, is my understanding. So 
they will be able to, to have, say, five lights on to illuminate potential areas that, that need it uh, while shutting down the entire field lighting. Um, we, we will be getting a, a presentation from, from the town uh, with their capital priorities, and certainly that can be a, a question to, uh, to be asked uh, potentially as well as operating costs. That wasn't something that I was able to identify for council for this presentation. So that's, that's something that might be uh, of interest to council when the town makes their presentation along with the functionality of it. A follow up, Councilor Lahid? Yeah, I think just, just one other mention too. I know recently the CHP unit was, was brought online. I just wonder if this would be a good fit with that, with that as well, because you have a constant power demand or large power demand. And, course uh, the efficiencies that are there with uh, providing heat as well as electricity might might be a good fit might be mm -hmm. a way to utilize that investment mm -hmm. Councillor Laird yes uh, I guess I was going down the same route um, do we have any idea of the utility operational costs of these lights um, obviously only it be on when the field is being used and then how do we determine how to turn these things on for the various users. And then I've got another subsequent question. Yeah, I, I, I've asked the um, community group and the, the town to um, identify the operating costs for council because I, I knew that would be a question. It's always a question uh, um, uh, from council. So we, we hope they will bring that um, for budget uh, uh, capital presentations um, and yeah certainly I think um, at that point we'll be able to identify some more of those functionality options with them um, as well but I don't have those answers today um, yes my supplemental question is I hope not too big of a rabbit hole but uh, um, I assume we'll be getting a more holistic picture of what rec, uh, Parks and Rec is looking for from a capital perspective uh, for 2020 uh, shortly because it's hard to just decide on one project not understanding the whole picture. Um, and it was mentioned about the spray park and it's great to have that up and operational, but it's my understanding that there's um, a bit of a challenge over there with regard to change rooms and washrooms, which we knew might be a problem. And currently, right now, it's my understanding they were at one point using the uh, contractors' porta potties. So I assume that we're going to need to build something there too. So I just think that's going to end up forming some sort of more uh, a larger holistic picture of the ask. So it, it, right now, it's really difficult, at least for me as just one piece to make this decision as a standalone without understanding the whole picture. So, just my comment, so I don't expect an answer. Councillor Duncan. Um, those are good comments. We have to also remember that CFIPs are, are these matching grants and it's good to be able to break these projects up a bit because it allows you to apply for multiple CFIPs as well. Uh, the other part of this for me that's important has, has been that I remember back, or, you know, in my previous days on the rec board is a skateboard park is really in need of lighting that gets a lot of use after hours and the ability to light that area up with the amount of youth that use that and, and the uh, worries in the community over that is, is important as well. So it's, you know, and I, as a council, we've always really supported these uh, matching grants as a way to, for the community to buy into some of these projects. It, but it will be good to see the overall rec plan as well. Councillor Lang. Um. Yes, thank you, Councillor Dunklin, Councillor Liard. I completely agree with your comments, so I won't repeat what you've already said. Um, another question I had is so many of our community groups, especially out in the county, they have to raise um, half, basically, what the county's going to contribute. And when I, I think of Nordig, and uh, with their uh, uh, park out there, the community raised the same amount that the county put in. And we see Farrier Hall with their fundraising and trying to get equal equal dollars uh, for their for their ass. Um, the minor football here is contributing twenty five thousand. And so my thoughts are, if uh, 
they contributed 50,000, then they asked to the town and the county would be 50,000. Have they thought of that? Um, I'm not sure if, if they've, uh, you know, certainly asked to contribute more. Um, the, the CFIP grant uh, kind of requires this split in, in level of, uh, of user group funding. So they've essentially fundraised and, and come up with their um, minimum level uh, uh, of, of funding that they have to come up with. And, and then uh, this is the typical uh, split between municipal contributions and the CFIP grants with the, the matching uh, components. So um, beyond, beyond that, I do know as um, Councillor um, Duncan pointed out, washrooms are, are, and, and change rooms are still high on the football team's priority list. Um, um, right now, I think the only plan that the town has as far as their capital priorities includes phase two of the um, Christensen development where change rooms would be located for, for the football club. Um, so they may be fundraising for, for that project, um, but um, I'm not aware of, of, of them offering um, to fund this project more um, beyond what the CFIP application. That's truly what's driving kind of this project is CFIP. And without that CFIP grant, um, it, it wouldn't move forward. Um. Deputy Reeves Swanson. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Um, I believe it was 2016 that there was a mat, uh, recreation master plan that was drawn up and presented in the fall of 2017. Um, I can re-forward that to everybody. I know we got it as a part of the rec board, but I will forward that again to all the council. Um, the, uh, the football club had applied for the CFIP grant under the Masters Games uh, the year private prior so that's this is like a continuation of this because they weren't granted that at that time so this is a bit of a follow-up to that to try again and I they weren't the only group that had applied under the master's games umbrella to try and uh, get funds from the from the government matching funds I guess from the Alberta government at that time so um, that's where the, the the back more of the background has come for this particular ask so just for clarity Councillor Laird. Nothing? Well, the staff recommendation is that we receive this for information. So seeing no further questions, can I have a councillor make a motion, please? Councillor Vandermeer, all in favour? Motion carries 7-0. to zero. Item 5.1, the Joint Emergency Management Agreement 2021 Renewal. Good morning. Good morning, members of council. Good to go. And before the strategic planning committee uh, of the whole uh, is the Clearwater Regional Emergency Management uh, Joint Emergency Management Agreement. Um, the Clearwater Regional Emergency Management Advisory Committee received a copy of this agreement at their last meeting in June, uh, and they were their motion for their respective councils was to review and provide recommendations for any amendments to the current agreement, which is a five-year term, uh, which is up in February, so that uh, time ticks away pretty quickly. So I wanted to get that before the committee to discuss. Um, attached within the agenda item is the the existing agreement um, and would look for council and the committee of the whole's comments in terms of whether there was any uh, amendments that were required uh, to the agreement itself that would take us into a new term in 20 early 2021 um, administratively we can do some cleanup on the agreement in terms of alignment with the new emergency management legislation the lemur um, but in terms of the major components of the agreement um, as as the committee looks through it, um, this is an agreement with a, a cost share 
60% county, 35% town, 4% village, 1% summer village. Uh, I believe that's a longer standing um, split uh, than the five-year agreement itself. And um, the committee makeup is another component. Uh, there's two elected officials from the town, two from the county, one from the village and the summer village. And again, it was a five-year term of the, the previous agreement. So looking for the committee's comments in terms of if, um, if the agreement is good as is to roll over into another five years or if there's any suggestions for future changes. That's, that's my presentation. Thank you. Any questions, comments from Council? Deputy Reeve Swanson. Um, under 9.2, Article 9, General, I, it's just 9.2B. It said that, uh, you know, notification by fax machine or email. <laughs> are, we, are we really still faxing? Question. We do still receive faxes, <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, really? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but certainly there we can modernize the language in the agreement to include digital okay. transmissions of information for sure. Thanks. Councillor Duncan. Has the agreement really been, I guess for lack of a better word, tested? Like if we had to enact, you know, that's, I guess my only question is, is has it worked from, you know, do we, it doesn't, because if there's a fire, like, it may not necessarily be activated, right? It's, um... In the last five years, there hasn't been a large-scale emergency where it needed to be in, enacted, which is great <laughs> to be able to tell you, but then you're right, the new agreement doesn't have, um anything as an example behind it. Uh, the other thing the agreement doesn't reference is that even, even though we have a regional agreement for our partnership with the other municipalities, is that there would still be a delegation of authority required if, for instance, the Village of Caroline had an incident and they needed us to come in and, and assist with that emergency management on their behalf, they would still have to write permission to us, uh, which would be a, their committee's motion to say that we delegate authority to Clearwater County, and then this is the box, essentially what, what that authority would look like, whether it's dollars or um, areas within emergency management. So, you know, maybe we took over their emergency social services and helped with the people management if there was an evacuation or something like that. Okay. So I guess I'm not quite understanding then. So if there is an emergency and it was in the town or in the village, they have to still sign off on it even though Correct. It, we have a regional thing and something in place. Yes, so the regional is, um, in, in my mind, the way the agreement is written, it's intended to be a, a regional uh, planning agreement. So we plan together, we have a regional plan, we have regional training, we have regional exercises, um, and we kind of work as a group. We have regional stakeholders in our um, emergency agency. So. But, but there's it, still that delegation of authority. When it comes down to the actual yeah, emergency. Yeah, when it comes okay. down to an actual emergency, there still has to be a delegation of authority. Even if they've appointed uh, a regional director of emergency management, it still requires their sign-off because we can't declare a, a state of local emergency on their behalf. And we okay. certainly can't go in and take over authority until it's granted to us. Okay, good. Thank you for the clarification. No problem. So the staff recommendation that the committee reviews the current joint emergency management agreement and provide administration direction on any amendments required for the 2021 renewal. Uh, Councillor Lang. Just a thought that popped into my head. Would it make more sense to have a three-year agreement rather than a five-year? I'm just thinking if there was an emergency and we did have to enact this, we could learn from from learn from the learnings and uh, maybe amendments would be needed so I'm just wondering if three year made more sense. Councillor Duncan? Uh, I think we still would have the ability to go in and amend if we needed to and I would tend to just longer terms are better just so we're not time flies and we'd be going over this again right so yeah. um, it's just my thoughts there. Councillor Laird? I would so move the uh, suggested uh, that the committee reviews the current joint uh, emergency management agreement and provide administration. Um, I think we just move forward with it. it uh, I was at that meeting and um, 
there was really nothing of significance other than to make sure that we follow the next piece of leg you know the legislation as it changes. Um, so it's uh, I think good to move forward, and I understand the reasoning behind your uh, thoughts, Councillor Lang, with regard to three year. But uh, this one, you're right, it hasn't really been tested, but I, I believe there is room for amendment to, uh, it within that five years if we find that we need to uh, amend it. You know, I would call that a friendly amendment, I hope, in the future, if we should need to do it. Deputy Reeve Swanson. Nope. So you have the motion? Does anyone need it read back? Christine, is there any issues that you were looking for direction on that have not been mentioned yet? Um, no, I touched on the highlights, the, the term, the percentage split, and the committee makeup, and it sounds like um, from the conversation of the Strategic Planning Committee that uh, there's no, no major changes required. So, um, and our representatives at that CREMA committee when we meet in October can, can speak to that on the, the county's behalf for sure. Um, and... We'll just we'll bring that back to council for approval once a new draft agreement is ready, but it'll probably be later this year, early 2021. So we have a motion. Any further discussion on the motion? I will ask the question. All in favor? Motion carries seven to zero. Item 5.2, the Leslieville Public Services Building, Phase 2 Firefighter Training Grounds. Good morning again. I will kick this one off. Um, as, as the committee will recall, Council previously reviewed the site contour concept plan for the Leslieville Public Services building. Uh, I did attach it to the uh, agenda item, um, just as a refresher. And um, at their March 24th meeting, directed administration to proceed with advertising, which was phase one, uh, the grading and the building. The three or five bay option was included in that process as well as the land grading for that phase two, the training grounds area. And then at their June meeting, uh, that's when council authorized proceeding with the three bay option in Leslieville, which the construction is now underway. I know the infrastructure department of public works has kept council updated on the progress as, as that goes through. They have completed some of the earthworks, um, all of the earthworks for that project, uh, which was approximately 19 acres and included that phase two firefighter training grounds. Um, so as, as administration is looking to start creating the 2021 budget for council's approval, wanted the strategic planning committee to uh, take a look at this phase two project and uh, provide you some additional information and then seek direction for capital budget considerations for future year or years, depending on what uh, the committee and council uh, ultimately decides. Um, so as the committee may recall as well, during 2020 capital budget deliberations, council approved $100,000 for the Lessieville Firefighter Training Center for some additional groundwork required for construction of the, the one piece, the live fire training tower. Uh, again, that's in phase two in the site concept plan that's attached. And there was an additional 400,000 that was set aside in the preliminary 2021 capital budget for the live fire training building itself. Um, since that time, uh, we've, We've got further details in terms of cost for what the grounds would cost, um, piece by piece, I guess, and we've included that in the agenda item. Uh, we engaged WSP to provide some of those preliminary estimates for groundwork, which includes some of the gravel and concrete materials for the road, the underground water and hydrants. Um, and as uh, the committee will recall, that was also something that was uh, scaled back in the phase one. and. Uh, it was decided at that time that the uh, underground uh, materials for the uh, hydrant system as well as the road wouldn't be built at phase one time and that would wait for phase two. And, um, and then there's a, uh, multiple pad sites. So um, for each of these components, those are included below in the uh, cost estimates um, that are attached to the agenda item. And um, one last piece of information as well is a firefighter training center reserve was previously established by council and that was utilizing the revenues from the 2017 to 2019 wildfire deployments. Um, and that was a recommendation of the former fire committee at that time. And this reserve currently sits at $484,207.50. 
and um, uh, below, if we keep, oh, it's up there on the screens, the uh, costs for the training grounds are, are listed there. Um, the underground hydrants and water system is 114,000. Road infrastructure and that uh, infrastructure, 44,000. Uh, I do believe that in that road infrastructure will include some aproning, which would be a gravel apron to the pad sites for the training center. Uh, the burn tower itself, um, which is where they can do the live burn tower. I have my subject matter expert. We can speak to that further for sure. Uh, the gravel and concrete pads for all of the different areas that have been previously talked about for training. Uh, a U-dike, which is a hazmat um, concrete diking for um, materials management. Uh, and then some of the basic stuff, uh, landscaping mobilization and then that 10% contingency, which is what we like to include and uh, engineering, and that is a total of $1.4 million. And with that reserve and the existing 100,000, that leaves about $840,000 remaining to complete the project. Um, this is something the committee can certainly recommend council consider in pieces, um, but I know they, in speaking with WSP, they did mention that there would be cost efficiencies obviously to do the, the work all at one time just due to mobilization and material volumes, that's what their quotes are based on. So it could certainly change if, if there was um, future phases, uh, piecemeal type development of the firefighter training grounds. Um, and I know I'll, I'll let uh, Chief DBN speak to the, uh, the live fire training building if there's any questions on that, but that was something, uh, size and scope, that was already discussed with the battalion training officers group. Um, and it's based on a, and I guess it was a quote. Uh, we do have a design copy for uh, the committee if they wish to see that. I just didn't want to include that in the agenda package because it is a privileged piece of information. It's a quote. And um, once the determination of scope of the firefighter tra training center is made, construction um, is nearing completion, I guess. Administration would propose that we'd also bring back to council a user fee policy uh, and re-engage some of our municipal counterparts uh, and emergency service counterparts. And as we've had some that have expressed interest in, in utilizing a facility of this type in our area. So that would come at a future time. That those dollars would be, uh, my recommendation would be to offset some of the operational cost for the, for the, um, the facility itself, including the Lesseville Public Service Building. And uh, should the committee recommend council approve this firefighter training center or any of its components, uh, we would adjust the 2021 capital budget accordingly or future budget years. And uh, the committee could also recommend that future fire deployment or any facility rev rental revenues be set aside in that fire training reserve to either build those future pieces or to uh, maintain over time. And uh, lastly, should the committee recommend council approve the um, complete phase two training center, we would also propose proceeding with uh, building out that industrial training component at the same time. Um, industrial use of that training facility would see use of that concrete, one of the concrete pads which has the boil over prop. And uh, then there would be some mobilization of additional rail cars for industrial training use on the site. And um, that portion could be included in an operational budget. The, um, we spoke last week again with CP's Hazardous Materials and Emergency Response Team and they indicated um, that they would provide support. Uh, they didn't feel that um, a memorandum of understanding was required. They were happy to donate materials, help us set up the uh, training derailment scenario and participate um, under that fee policy that I mentioned so that they would pay to use the facility. So they, they, they have done that in other communities where they've donated um, components for their training centers. Um, usually it's a rail car that's already been uh, scrapped because of a derailment somewhere else and they put it on a train and, and bring it to the municipality that can use that for their emergency response training. And um, that would be the extent of their partnership. Uh, and then we'd certainly be able to have that component opened up to industry users as well. And that is the sum of my presentation. Um, and I'll leave it to any questions of the committee, please. Any questions from Council? Uh, Councillor Vandermeer. Uh, just a question on your uh, discussion with CP Rail. Uh, I, I, 
what I heard is that uh, they will donate some equipment, but they will make no commitment to use this facility. Yes, they didn't want to commit to a certain number of weeks per year. Um, they just said they use m multiple facilities. They use some down south. They use some in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, they certainly would anticipate, as training is required in this region, that they would, would use the facility. Um, <coughs> but they weren't willing to commit to a certain number of weeks per year or anything of that nature. Uh, initially, they, uh, they did have some staff transition from the first contact we had to who we were speaking with uh, in the last few months. But um, the extent they just said, you know, this is typically a donation. We typically provide those rail cars and, you know, certainly have their staff with expertise in setting up a derailment scenario, can come help and assist as part of their ongoing partnership with us. Uh, we do other things with them, kind of joint training and, and things like that. So they thought that it didn't need to be a formalized agreement, that if we set a policy for fee for usage, that they would just use the facility when, when required. So uh, uh, what other facilities would be available to them in Alberta? Well, I might kick that over to our subject matter expert. I think, is it Brooks? Uh, I believe Brooks has one that is... Um, been in play for many years and I it's right downtown Brooks so it does cause some problems internally and it is very limited in scale um, Brooks has and I, I'm going back my memory I've only been there a couple of times but I believe Brooks only has what they call a cake prop for foam application and a single rail car so very very small so uh, what would we have by comparison to Brooks Back to the initial conversation, what we were looking at is um, bringing in the boil over prop, which would be one of the only other ones in Canada. Um, I believe JI may have one that's in play, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so it would be the boil over prop. We were looking at a couple of uh, rail cars to do plugging and, and um, patching on to uh, basically enhance the hazardous materials type <coughs> of incident where we were dealing with <coughs> slits in the tanks and stuff like that and then we were looking at an 8 to 10 car derailment of multiple different cars um, not just your general purpose tanker cars that we see come through but some flat cars and some of the other type of materials which would be the only one um, from my my knowledge would be from Alberta Saskatchewan Manitoba I believe the only other one would be JI to that size with 8 to 10 car derailment so we would have multiple cars, have eight or ten cars laying around here. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Lang. Um, I have a few questions. What would be the ongoing operational costs on a yearly basis with this? Um, because it's a static, uh, once constructed, uh, concrete gravel padding, um, that would be probably included in the facility's uh, capital and, uh, sorry, operational budget. Uh, I don't expect there would be a whole bunch. It's, it's essentially gravel and concrete on the ground. Year over year, there could be some gravel replacement, um, kind of minor operational cost, uh, other than the, the stuff that they would do to um, clean up, which would be, happen on training nights and things like that. If it was an auto extrication and they did an extrication and they had some, some cleanup, it would be kind of brooming out materials or what have you and then uh, disposing them. But uh, again, it would be more planning for future um, either phases or minor um, operational costs related to the gravel on the ground. Okay, so my second question is, uh, how many days do you uh, participate in training in Red Deer? It's 1800 dollars a day my understanding to go to Red Deer so how many days um, would your would you go to Red Deer to train so right now we go to Red Deer for four days a year um, and that that challenges us when we look at our training package to do four days in Red Deer that is focused 100% on our recruit firefighters that gets them through their 1001 level one and their 1001 level two. Um, outside of that, our fire members do not see a lot of interior fire attack basing like back to their techniques and skill set that we've trained them to. 
I guess a good way to look at it is when we look at CPR, we have to train every year on CPR, but we don't train every year on live fire. And it's something that the fire calls, like active fires are decreasing, but the risk is increasing. When you start to look at what the makeup of the homes are, faster um, collapse once you get impingement into the structural members. And just, I mean, we talked about it prior um, in a previous council meeting when you, I mean, we're sitting on comfortable gasoline now and things, fire are progressing a lot faster and a lot hotter than they ever were. So the training piece and that ongoing part is huge. Um, okay. I did a little math here. At four days a year, that'd be equivalent to 194 years to pay for this build, building. If we were just training um, new recruits, correct? Um, I think the intent, uh, we've talked about it administratively, was we'd probably see use of this six weeks of the year. Um, and that would be from our, our training, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, because uh, I know you've talked with your staff about it a, a lot more detailed than, than we've had conversations, but um, that would mean our regular training weekly nights, the different stations could come and, and participate in training um, within our community, as opposed to leaving the community in, in a bunch and training in, in Red Deer. But certainly this is a long-term investment for the community in their fire service training. Um, so I don't disagree that the cost per day would, would be year over year quite a bit uh, before you'd recoup that cost if we're only doing recruit training. Councillor Laird. Um, Yes, uh, you made the offer uh, that we could have uh, or be provided with a design copy. Uh, that would help me uh, a lot. I don't know about the rest of council, but uh, um, that would be very helpful. Um, I have a few comments and a number of questions. So where are the stations training now and how, how often? Oh, here. I'll hand it over. Yeah. <laughs> so if the... If the council will bear with me through my net multitude of questions. Councillor Laird, that's a really good question. So right now, our recruits were going um, once a year to Red Deer for our 1001 Level 1 training and testing weekend, and our 1001 Level 2 again once a year for training and testing. Outside of that, that is all of our firefighters get for live fire type training. Um, when it comes to our weekly training, we're doing everything in-house. We're, we're moving things around. We purchased a couple years ago the Bolex props for vehicle firefighting um, and flammable liquids. So we've got that that's in a trailer that moves station to station. Um, and then the stations, we're, we're literally piecing it together and probably not doing justice when it comes to our training. Like We're, we're using props that are a challenge to work with and not consistent across the board. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it sounds like the challenges continue. Um, I know at one point we, and, and this is more of a historic comment, um, we would have to sign off an agreement with uh, Public Works to use the various gravel pits to set up some of this. And, there's MOB and DMOB costs associated with that as well. So I can appreciate, uh, and, it's, and it's a challenge for both departments then, of course. Um, so uh, with regard to um, the plan for the phased approach, it says over a number of years, um, I didn't really find a plan of how we could do that. And then the subsequent question, because we recognize there's efficiencies with one mobilization and demob, did we have any costs associated with that? Because they're kind of a hand and glove question, those two. Um, certainly we were looking at this point in, in terms of direction of whether we'd like it phased and then we'll come back with, with the uh, cost associated with those phases. So essentially if we look at the um, site contour plan, um, I would say that you could do the burn tower as one site uh, and then each of the prop pads individually and we would come back with pricing based on if you have one or two of those combined. We just didn't want to... Um, perhaps predict a scenario where the committee would recommend, you know, one or two, maybe three of the pads instead of five. Um, so certainly that 
uh, we could bring that back during budget time, if that makes sense for the committee. Um, if I may, uh, I appreciate that because I, I was looking for how many years, but it sounds like you would be looking for that direction, I guess, based on the plan that we would later see. Correct. That's yeah, so if you, if you know the, the cost of the 1.4 to do it in 2021, um, then you could certainly take each of those components and say, you know, if we wanted to do the live fire burning tower alone, um, not do any of the underground work or the road work to those other pad areas, we could certainly get started on it in 2021. Um, I guess administratively we're looking at uh, appetite for proceeding and in what scope and then we could come back with, and I mean perhaps the committee suggests a certain dollar amount, and then we could see what fits within that dollar amount. I wanted to provide at least preliminary information in terms of cost if we were to do it all at once. Okay, um, if I may? Yes. Um, so looking at this, and I recognize, um, count, uh, and I can very much appreciate Councillor Lang's um, consideration that it would take a number of years for us to cost recover based on four days. And what I'm hearing is our service would use this, the equivalent of six weeks um, of training. I would think that we would also be using it for various training nights as well uh, on top of it. And for skills, competencies, and maintenance, I can appreciate the need for that and keeping our own members close by. I, I'm looking at what we just were handed um, is this the only design we've looked at? I, I, I know most recently in the area, the um, city of Wetaskiwin recently built one. Um, do, have we looked into building our own, or is this the only one we've looked at so far? Again, I can really appreciate your questions, Councillor Laird. When it comes to these sites like this, we took a look at magnitudes of them, um, and this is just one that we kind of lay, lay down on, is it had everything that we were looking at as a template. Being over, or being the cost it is, it would have to go to tender. So we would clean that up along the way. Uh, we originally looked at Fire Training Solutions, which was a big manufacturer in Alberta. Um, they were constructed out of Lethbridge. Um, unfortunately, they are no longer around in service. Um, and then we started looking around to see what other makes were out there. And we came across Drager, which is actually being built in Leduc now, so it's close. It's the shipping costs on these containers start to, to increase the budget tremendously. Um, looking around, there's a, a bunch of other ones. We have debated on what the cost would be to do it on our own, where we buy the sea cans and have a, a welder build them. And that's something that I think we can explore a little bit deeper, but it's they're going to have to be engineered now, which is going to be a bit of a, a cost too as well. Not 100% sure. But for the, the purpose of the budgeting, we kind of land on this structure, which seemed to be an all-encompassing facility where it's not just a burn room. It's kind of got everything that we train with in, internally for a, a figure. Yeah. I appreciate your patience, uh, my fellow councillors. Uh, so have we looked at a scaled down version of this at all like this this looks fairly elaborate i, I can appreciate what we're going for but it, <clears throat> is there a scaled down version i see this is for the town of collid colladen yep. yeah. oh in terms of scaled down no this was uh, like i said the battalion training officers met kind of had their wish list in terms of what they'd like to see in a training uh, live fire training center uh, that was one of the discussions we had administratively is that if the if the committee says you know too large should we scale it back uh, that would be something we would bring back as part of that um, budget for council's consideration at that time as well yes and, and I can appreciate that so uh, you know I, I would think that even a scaled down version would be certainly better than zero things and have we considered um, approaching a local welding or fabrication company um, to help us build it in this engineering because uh, you know we've got local fabrication companies literally down the road from here uh, from where we're proposing to put this so I see that as a potential uh, opportunity within the community when we talk about um, you know projects and keeping our locals busy uh, is that something we've considered 
Uh, depending on the scope of the project, we can certainly, it would, uh, if it hits a certain dollar threshold, we have to put that out to tender, but uh, they would be more than welcome to, to bid on that. I guess if it was uh, under $200,000, then uh, perhaps we could sole source that, but for construction, it has to be uh, tendered <clears throat> if it's over 200000 One question. So I know everybody needs a turn, and I appreciate it. I feel like I'm monopolizing this, and that's not my intent. Um, so this is more of a comment and something that perhaps needs to be considered. I recognize that having something like this would be beneficial to our area and that other, other localized or I'll say regionalized um, fire services <coughs> and maybe even uh, search and rescue groups would be happily uh, uh, content to use something much closer. I also recognize the limitations that Red Deer Fire Department is having with their facility. They are uh, looking at their options for moving their facility, at least they were at one point, because the town, the city of Red Deer has grown around them. Um, so the minute that anything gets too close, um, it usually challenges these groups. So I would consider, or at least ask staff and our council to consider, you know, we do invest in various things in the community. Perhaps we need to consider this as an investment and that we cost recover against the capital investment much like we do with Nordic. Perhaps that's another opportunity to consider as we move forward. Um, other than those comments for now, I, I appreciate the patience and, uh, and looking forward to some future answers and, and thoughts sure. and concepts. Mm -hmm. Councillor Lang. So just a couple comments here. So I did the math based on using the facility for um, six weeks, and it works out to take about 30 years to pay for it. Um, another um, consideration I have, it seems like some of these um, training that you're wanting to offer really belongs under search and rescue, and I hate to... Um, duplicate. I hate, like, for example, um, high angle rescue. Um, search and rescue is already involved in a lot of the stuff that fire is actually going out there. So, search and rescue is trained very well under the RCMP. Um, a, a lot of their high angle um, mountain rescue, it's done right out there in the rocks and the mountains. Uh, ice rescue done out there and I just I kind of see kind of a fire kind of uh, getting involved in that area and as a counselor I'm very concerned about the duplication of tax dollars so I myself like I really appreciate the fire department <laughs> don't get me wrong but um, fire is fire and it just seems like it's starting to get into its fingers into too many things and the taxpayers are the ultimate ones who pay for it. Uh, any comment? Um, I, I don't have a comment specific to Councillor Langs, uh, other than we are training to what service levels we have within our existing intermunicipal um, fire service, fire rescue service agreement. Um, in terms of uh, Councillor Laird's comments and other user groups, I know Chief has spoken with some of his counterparts, um, some emergency services. I know uh, we were passed along. Team Rubicon, Team Rubicon was one that mentioned uh, that perhaps they would use the facility. And again, until it's like the chicken and the egg scenario, until we have um, some confirmation of what we're going to build, and then we can start to to plan that policy for council for fee usage as well as what um, marketing plan we can do to get that out there for other um, communities. There's a couple of rail communities, a couple of oil and gas community, uh, sorry, industry users, uh, as well as some rural uh, fire rescue services have all indicated that if there was a facility in West Central that they would potentially be using that. Again, I can't um, nail down specific folks or dates or how many, how many weeks of the year that they would be using it. Um, but I think administratively we could uh, try and ma maximize the usage of a facility like that to do something uh, similar to what Councillor Laird mentioned and kind of offsetting those, those costs and, and funding it back hopefully sooner than the 30 years Councillor Lang um, had mentioned. But again, until we know the scope of the facility that we are able to build, we, we'd be able to provide some better detail in terms of what that could look like if we had an average, you know, 
25 weeks of the year, how many users, uh, what would that be? So, um, and I think, I think that's it I ha that I had in terms of comments. Um, I guess from the committee's perspective, we're looking for that uh, appetite for scope uh, of the project for the 2021 budget and, and, or future years, and we can certainly provide those dollar details if we have to break it out piece by piece. Councillor Lahey. Um, yeah, I guess just a question. I, this is the first time I've seen the, uh, the sketch here of the, of the, of the burn facility. Uh, it appears to be modular. Does that mean it could be built like Lego? It could be altered over time or it could be added to or taken away to keep uh, the variety of training fresh for all the firefighters? And uh, yeah, maybe you could just comment on that. Where to start with that one? <laughs> <laughs> So yes, as long as we've got a detailed phase plan with it, that way if there's a hatch that has to be put in on one of the lower cans or one of the first place cans and it just builds off of that. Um, one of the reasons why we landed on this is we reached out to Drager, which is a very reputable company within the fire rescue organization, and they provided us just a budgetary price information. And um, just to bring it back around to kind of, I think will answer your question a little bit, Councillor Lougheed. So Drager's basic phase A, which is residential two-story simulator, so two stories, was $514,000, where this one was the six seventy-five. dollars so you saw a larger footprint, larger increase. And I know we went back and forth a number of times with Drager saying, well, how come this Caledon one is actually cheaper than what you guys proposed in a, in a quote? And they had no answer for us. Um, other than they would hold to their price in the Caledon one, which didn't make a lot of sense. When we put everything that was in this Caledon one into the Dreger price quote that they gave us, it came to... It was in the millions. It was into the millions of dollars, which I'm not quite sure why, but we, we went across and line by lined it to make sure that everything was there, and it, and it was, which raised eyebrows a little bit. Um, but it can be piecemealed together. Um, when we look at the structure, one of the reasons we went four stories is so we can utilize an aerial device it's got the ability to, to do just about every service that we have in one structure. When you look at the city of Red Deer, they've got one burn structure and one CCAN structure there that they do a lot of their other type of training in now. And like Councillor uh, Laird mentioned, they are looking at a, at a new home for it. So there's going to be some disruption there at one point. And I guess just one other question around costs and stuff like that. Right now, if I remember correctly, we we firefighters train on almost a weekly weekly basis every week every week mm -hmm. and uh, so their opportunity to train on this they have say 50 weeks a year that they train and there's only four weeks opportunity to access a structure like this as we are currently is that correct four days four four, days. four so, sorry four days and that's only part of the that's not the entire, um, not the entire service. So I could see leaps and bounds of uh, the the possibilities here for uh, enhanced training and keeping people familiar with the skills and and posing those uh, the scenarios. There's so many different scenarios that could be done with this. So that's just basically a comment that I see great opportunity here. And of course, there is costs involved with the training we do now. And I'd see some efficiencies here for using, spending those same training dollars we are now by having people train every week, but having a much better experience or a much more broad scenario um, for, for the kind of things that the firefighters are going to potentially encounter in an emergency situation. So I, I don't know if you have any comment around that. Absolutely, Councilor Heed. Um, we've talked administratively on what this would look like rolled forward into our service. Uh, knowing that we would have to come up with a plan, for an example, if we brought the Village of Caroline or Station 30 up into this training center, that would leave that community exposed. So was there training opportunities that we can shift stations around to cover that and what that would look like? And originally, we're talking about at least once a month to have every station at the training center. Um, that way we can provide backfill to these other communities and, and get that experience in there. One of the big things within this is under the live fire conditions, firefighters can view the phases of fire and the development and its physical changes when it changes from solid fuel 
um, brought about the increase of heat or paralysis. The buildup of combustible gases at the ceiling, the rapid expansion and subsequent ignition of fire gases that roll across the ceiling, something that we can't do currently for our experienced firefighters. We do it once a year for our recruits. During exercises like this, firefighters also can learn a variety of types of nozzle patterns, their effectiveness on thermal layering, and how visibility can change by upsetting that thermal layering. Um, during live fire training, it's critical that it establishes a command system to be in place that also is an ideal time for new firefighters to drill on the incident command systems. Moving in and out of the established divisions within organizational structures and effectively practice crew integrity and personal accountability on a training ground. So it, it is a big, larger package that we instill in our, our new recruits. But after you've been here, you get your 1001 level one, your 1001 level two, you don't have access to a burn structure unless you become an instructor and, and spend maybe one day there every number of years. Deputy Reeve Swanson. Um, I, this is a question for Councillor Lang. Um, I just did a quick math too, and I didn't come up with 30 years. I came up with 18. So I just wanted to know what your base was. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I took the tra training dollars a day times six weeks divided by the capital cost that the total capital cost, and I came up with uh, just over 18 years payback. So if you would mind find clarity for me. <laughs> If I can remember how I did my math, I took the um, one million four hundred thousand, divided it by the thirty days of training, that came up with uh, forty-six thousand six hundred and sixty-six dollars, and then uh, I worked that out with. Uh, um, I have to figure out what I did with that, but I, I started off with that. That would be what it would be per year. So I guess if you take the uh, one million four hundred and divide it by that, that should give me the thirty years. Uh, I, I guess I was using uh, Christine's uh, referral that they would use it for six weeks a year, so I took the forty two days. Well, six weeks, that's thirty days. Six weeks times seven is forty two. Well, I've gone five day week. Okay. Well, I used it. Like, I. I I, I didn't figure you'd be going seven days a week. I worked it on five days a week. Okay, that's where the... That's probably a discrepancy. So, well, that would make right up. There. But, yeah, you take that, it works out for 30 years. Great. Councilor oh. Randomir? Gross. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Christine, you mentioned that the training that we do is, uh, is uh, in line with requirements under the Regional Fire Agreement. And... Uh, Within the regional fire agreement, we have, uh, I guess, the biggest center is Rocky Mountain House in terms of uh, building structures. And uh, I, I note here that the town of Caledon is uh, really a suburb of Toronto, it looks like, and they have a, uh, it's down in Ontario, has a population of 66,000, so they have, they have quite a few larger buildings. Now, we don't have many large buildings in the county that, uh, um, that uh, we would be protecting. We do have quite a few within the town. So my question is, has the town uh, uh, given an indication of strong support for this? Um, I have, we haven't had that discussion with the town because it's a county facility uh, and the location um, that is funded by Clearwater County 100%. Uh, sure, it's funded. Clearwater County, but in terms of training, uh, applicable training would uh, be, I would suggest, uh, significantly f to the benefit of the town of Rocky Mountain House, uh, probably s a lot more benefit than, uh, than Clearwater County uh, structures. Mm -hmm. There is an upcoming uh, Intermunicipal Collaboration Committee meeting in October, and that uh, would be, a, I think, the ideal time to, to broach that subject, so we'll certainly administratively make sure that that's included in the agenda package. Okay, certainly, like this, this burn tower uh, is, uh, is, is pretty expensive in, in the scheme of things. And uh, the city of Red Deer, uh, you mentioned that they have something not quite this elaborate. They're going to have to probably move. Uh, I would think that they will move. They will have something 
for red deer, yeah. and uh, therefore I, uh, I I am concerned about uh, the outside usage, and I'm also concerned about uh, uh, the amount of training that we would and should do for Clearwater County. Has there been discussions with with the city of Red Deer, perhaps in a partnership for a burn tower in Leslieville? If they're having to move their facility, maybe they'd be interested in getting it away from their residents. I'm, just a thought. We haven't had that conversation, no. Okay. So the staff recommendation from the agenda package that the Committee of the Whole review the Leslieville Firefighter Training Grounds proposal and recommend phase two components completion of the internal roadway, water line, hydrants, concrete and gravel pads, and the live fire burn tower for inclusion in Council's 2021 capital budget and any components for future budget years. So any thoughts on that recommendation? Councillor Duncan? Um, so this, this facility was, you know, is an expensive one capital-wise, and as Councillor Lang has pointed out, it's, it takes a long time to recoup the cost, which is why there's, you know, nobody's out there in the private sector doing this kind of stuff. It's similar to broadband. Uh, in, I, in my view, I think this would be used quite extensively by outside, because if somebody in central Alberta builds one, I don't think other councillors are going to really justify building their own if there's one to rent at a reasonable cost, of course. But you say the capital investment here is such that it, that as long as they're willing to rent it, it would, or the cost is reasonable, I think other, other municipalities would rent this one. I am intrigued by the suggestion that we look at a partnership. You know, there's two ways to look at that, right? Is it if we invest in it and charge them if they're willing to come here, it basically, you know, we get the money back that way. If they invest, then we're not charging them, right, to use it if, if they're an investor in it as well. So uh, a philosophy there on whether you want to be the owner-operator or, or, or not. And scheduling comes down to then who, who gets to use it on what day as if, uh, if there's two owners of it, right, then there's, that's another consideration there is how to schedule training and with two bosses basically over the same facility, so. Um, I, I would suggest that it would be, I, or I would prefer that we could do more of this locally, like you say, but it's, and to do that, we have to certainly fall into that 200,000 or less. And so for the burn tower, it's, uh, you know, I, I understand it's a big structure, but then if it's not as big as it is, I think definitely the city of Red Deer is not going to be coming here to use it if it's not, not the prob you know, my limited experience with something like this, but it's not attractive to them if it's not going to fulfill all the training needs they have and they certainly have bigger buildings than we do so uh, if we want to source this out I think we have to build it almost to this scale uh, if we could do it over a couple three years so that we could stay below the 200,000 on the burn tower if you know with sea cans and in theory you know it should be build it like a Lego um, although there is cost efficiencies with building it all at once and it gets into service quicker and you start realizing a return on it as well. So um, I guess I would have fair confidence that our local contractors being that close to this facility could make a competitive bid even if it was for the whole amount. So I'm good either way whether we try and phase it or or go but we've set aside the land we've started doing a bunch of the work already we're part way down this road. Um, if we really didn't want a fire training facility we should have really looked long and hard before we went ahead with even some of the groundwork we've already done. Councillor Vandermeer. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I guess I'm, I'm concerned about the remarks about CP Rail and the idea of bringing in 10 rail cars and, and doing these, uh, uh, these, uh, demonstration uh, uh, projects to uh, to handle various types of rail cars um, in the early discussions on this facility CP rail was touted as a uh, as a user that uh, uh, the expectation I I had uh, 
gotten was that uh, they would use this if, if we were to build it. Now they're not committing to do that. Uh, similarly, the idea that uh, the burn tower uh, would uh, attract other users. I, I want to see something real in terms of commitment on this. Uh, I, I like the suggestion that uh, you know some discussion take place with the city of Red Deer. Uh, if they really want to get out and significantly out of the city of Red Deer, uh, Leslieville would be an, an appropriate uh, location. Uh, but if they don't, I think it's important that we know that because they are the biggest uh, concentration of significant sized buildings in, in central Alberta. So uh, I think that's an important conversation. And, uh, and you know, doing this for the oil and gas industry and for CP Rail, um, they seem to be meeting their needs at this point in time. So it's, it's kind of like uh, stepping out into, into a business and uh, it's not something that we need in Clearwater County. We have very limited rail uh, track. And uh, I think we, uh, we currently uh, have one train a week or something in that order. This is not a, this is not a high traffic zone for rails. So uh, this is a, a speculative business not geared to our area. And uh, that's a concern to me. So. Uh, most of this is uh, above and beyond, and I have a lot of trouble with it. Thank you. Councillor Lang. Um, so my, I have a question, and my comments are along those of Councillor Vandermeer's. Um, I do think this could be a very attractive facility, and I, um, when I look at it, it looks like um, it's kind of a Taj Mahal of fire training facilities. And... If it could attract other municipalities um, and they would make use of it and we'd get a payback, I, I would be okay with this. But I'd like to see some homework done on um, other municipalities and who would, who would use it. My concern is we're on the west edge of Alberta here. Mainly all the municipalities are to the east of us. Uh, we also know Vermilion has a training center. I'm not, I'm not familiar with all the training centers in Alberta, but I've got concerns that they're actually going to travel out kind of to remote Alberta to use this. There's no facilities in Leslieville to stay overnight in, so I am uncertain of the use. Knowing that our um, linear gas and oil assessment model is being reviewed and we could lose... $3 million to $13 million, I'm just not sure if this is a priority. Um, our fire department does a very good job with what they have now. Um, and considering the payback time, I also am questioning how many um, fire railway calls has the department been called out to in the last 10 years? And if you do get called out to a railway, fire, rail, rail car fire, is it our taxpayers that pay for it? I get, or do we get reimbursed for those calls? I will try and answer that last question. Um, similar to any kind of industry, uh, our boundary would be within the county on the private lands. Um, if we're assisting with a containment um, initially, that would be something that would be invoiced back uh, to whatever user group it is, whether it's um, oil and gas industry or um, the rail industry. Did I miss another question? I'm not sure. Councilor Lougheed? Oh. Oh. oh, sorry. Any call-outs for rail, rail car fires in the last 10 years? I am not aware of any in the last five years. I'm not sure if we can go back any further than that. Um, certainly that's something we can look and provide to council. Councillor. Yeah, I didn't realize my light was on, but I don't want to make a comment. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I hear I definitely don't want to think of this facility being known as the Taj Mahal. Not, not the least of those is that the Taj Mahal is a tomb. 
and I don't want this to be a tomb for our firefighters, for sure. I don't want to be thought of that way. Uh, definitely, I know we are investing in, um, in the training of our firefighters. If we have 100 firefighters and we're spending $65 a week in, in uh, honorariums to those firefighters for, for that, that, that's a sizable investment already. I think the quality and the end result of safety and having our firefighters uh, being able to respond to all the potential emergencies, I think there is a value there for sure that is above just, uh, just the initial capital investment here. But uh, again, I do hear that we are going into uncertain times with, uh, with the changes to linear assessment and, um, and I think we have to be cautious on moving forward and might need to look at something in a scaled or phased version of this, but that's just my comment for the moment. Councillor Laird. Um, so, uh, with regard, I guess I'll I'll try to help with Councillor Lang's question with how many I can answer pre 2016, which will maybe I help hope help um, staff. Uh, prior to that, and I don't know if I am, I'm capturing just the five years or if it's more than that, but we had um, seven incidents four motor vehicle incidents involving a train where extrication was required in various parts along, uh, uh, along the line, two derailments, um, and two hazmat, sorry, I'm, I guess that's eight. And then we also uh, were the area that provided uh, rail training with um, CNCP, yeah, TransCare, TransCare. Uh, so if that helps with some sort of idea, so if I were to equate it to kind of numbers around that, I'd say it's, it actually works out to three quarters of one. So you can say one per year or a little less um, from a history. I do have a question, however. We've got approximately 12 acres, to give or take, for this training area, which can be done in a phased, uh, phased approach. Um, and I would think that you're looking at the, the training tower as being one of your priorities, is what I'm picking up on. Um, so the question that Councillor Vandermeer was, I think, asking, at least that's what came to my mind, is how much space does 10 or 8 or 10 rail cars take of that 12? At least that was the question that came to my mind, and I'm assuming that will take a little bit of space. kind of L-shaped portion um, beside the berm area is, is kind of what was envisioned where that would go. And again, that is just a grassed area uh, or will be a grassed area once they seed it and uh, the grass starts to grow. And as well, um, if we didn't put the rail cars there, that grassed area could be used for other types of training. It could be that um, wildland urban interface would burn off the grass and the the late summer, uh, early fall, um, and any other types of training that would be required if it's UTV or, or otherwise that would be outdoors. Um, I'm sure there's other departments that could use it for training as well. So um, that's kind of just the space that was earmarked for that area, for the rail. Um, and the boil over prop is like the other one, um, which is on the right hand side. I don't, I think with the site and contour plan, we probably will reorganize the order depending on what uh, the committee uh, provides in terms of recommendation to council for uh, what can be built or what phase two and perhaps phase three or other future phases would include. Um, in order for that industrial training, they'd need that boil prop as well. To, and that would be used from a uh, CRFRS standpoint, as well as it could be other industrial users. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, Councillor Laird is correct. The the burn tower would be uh, administration's first priority in terms of something to be built. Um, and again, that was the vision, I believe, of the, of the uh, regional fire committee uh, and its membership of the day, as it as the staff were going out on those deployments and 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 doing something um, with those dollars that provides that. Uh, investment in firefighter training for future. Councillor Vandermeer. 
Just to respond to Councillor Laird's uh, comment, I wasn't really concerned about the area that a few rail cars would take. I was uh, more concerned about the uh, types of training and the fact that there's $378,000 allocated for projects that are primarily related to um, rail and the oil and gas industry. And the oil and gas industry look after their own uh, in terms of uh, putting out fires. Um, they, they have uh, industry contracts, I believe. So the main thing there that I would see is auto extrication uh, is something that, yeah, I think we should be able to do that and train on that. And if we don't have adequate facilities, I would like to see that. But uh, uh, most of the rest of it, and I think therefore most of this capital, so I'm concerned on the, on the two big capital items, the $378,000. You know, for uh, I'm focusing on auto extrication. Seems like a lot of money, and uh, the burn tower for six hundred seventy-five thousand. Uh, uh, when uh, we can go to a facility uh, at Red Deer for a very small amount of money, so that's a lot of capital. I am concerned about the capital investment, not the ongoing operating costs, and and there's no indication really of uh, outside usage uh, for any of, for either of these and uh, so that's that's concerning particularly when um, uh, the idea of that CP rail would uh, would be a user and then they're not real willing to step up I'm, I'm concerned about that so we're spent we've got 675 plus 378 that's uh, that's a million dollars, <clears throat> and uh, the amount it would take to uh, to train for what we have to do in this area is, is a very small portion of that. So I, I'm concerned about the entire budget uh, at, at this time, uh, and and whether this really uh, these major items are uh, priorities at this point in time. Deputy Reeve Swanson. Um, while I um, respect Councillor Vandermeer's concerns in regards to the budget, I also believe a little bit uh, in regards that this is a vision for the future. This is not something that is going to be only used tomorrow and that's it. This is a substantial amount. It's an asset that will be in our community for many, many long years, and I'm talking 40, 50 years. <laughs> so I guess I look at it as being a visionary and going forward that we as leaders have to tell our fellow municipal municipalities that we are developing something that would be of interest to them, that would be of use for them in regards to their extra training. It is, we have to be out there to try and as much as, and I'm going to compare this to um, Red Deer County. Red Deer County is doing everything they can to attract business south Gasoline Alley. It's great on them. They have the location everything else. We need something to attract um, business and training whatever it is in our area. This is to me another possibility for private, for future consideration. And so I look at it as an asset and uh, to attract more people here. We know uh, through the summer that our first responders, which you guys are, um, not just firefighters, you are first responders, have had a very busy summer with all the extra people that we've had. So this to me is an Addis bonus training area. Uh, I see the priorities there. Uh, I would like to see us talk to um, of the possibility of Red Deer County coming here and, or, you know, with, with partnering or agreed to use the, the burn tower. But as far as, and and again, talk to the rail company as if, you know, yes, thank you for the assets, but understand that to to build this, that, you know, there has to be some commitment, time commitment, even if it was one week a year, that they agreed to use it. That's, that's something on paper. I know they're maybe hesitant about that, but uh, I, I believe we can push that a little bit to say this is 
this is to your benefit too. So I guess for me, um, I would like to see a little bit more of the breakdown on these things that you have talked about, uh, each of these props, Mobin, Mobout, that kind of thing, as we go forward into budget and um, make those. And really, between now and that, when we are doing our further deliberation, um, talk to our partners and our other municipalities is to see if we can get some firm agreements, memos of understanding, whatever, um, in uh, the use. And if it's next year or the year after, that, that you know, put a timeline to that. So with that, those commitments, those are just my comments. So I'd like to draw everyone back to the staff recommendation. Administration is looking for a number so they can plan their capital budget. So this council needs to give a number. So it's been good discussion. Okay. Is there a councillor who would care to start the discussion with a number? Councillor Vandermeer. $200,000. So Councillor Vandermeer, currently there is $484,000 in the fire training facility reserve. You are proposing $200,000 on top of that or $200,000 of that? $200,000 total. So you are proposing $200,000 out of the current $484,000. Okay. Comments or discussions? We... Councillor Duncan. I don't think that gets us very far down the road to build much of anything. Um, I, I would suggest yeah, I think we do need to have the conversations with, with Red Deer but, and other municipalities. Uh, I think it would be difficult to get them to commit to anything. Uh, but I, my question for them would be, would this, a facility like this satisfy your training requirements? Uh, you know, that's the starting point for me because then, you, you know, it, if it, they say no, then you're probably pretty sure they're not going to come here for very much training if it's not. Uh, I would be more in line with saying we either phase this over two or three years for me, probably two years for me in the capital budget. We have a significant amount here, 484000 in the firefighter reserve that's, you know, set aside for this. So, I, you know, proposing 200000 is only even half of that. Um, that's not enough for me to, and I don't think it gets us enough of a facility to, to do much training. So, Councillor Duncan, you were proposing that we take the total $1.4 million and break it down over three years. I'm not, I'm, yeah, um, two years for me is better. Two years. Two years, okay. I, I think if we're going to, like I said before, if, if we're going to have a training facility that attracts other people, you, A, you have to build it to a certain standard, which we can ask some questions and find that out, and B is, is that we have to get it up and running because it's currently Red Deer is looking seriously at moving. Um, if they're going to do something in the next year or two, if we wait too long and get half built and they move ahead on their own, or if, like say, it, if this is attractive, then we don't know that yet. But, and even other, there must be other places thinking about that as well. And I don't know what they're doing for their training right now, but and maybe they're not training to the same level we wish to train. I don't know. But uh, say, I, it's one of those things I think if you wait, phase it too long, we're probably going to miss out on opportunities. Somebody else will step up as well. Councillor Laird. Um, yes, I agree with Councillor Duncan's uh, um, approach to this. If we're going to do this, we're going to have to make some sort of level of serious commitment, um, a two-year phased approach, and recognizing that the burn tower would be the priority um, with the other burn prop areas uh, to follow in the second year um, makes good sense to me um, given that there there needs to be time also for I would suggest our staff to talk with uh, the Central Alberta training uh, group um, to find out who could and would use this facility I'm confident that we would hear hear I think verbal confirmation I think what our council is looking for is something in writing even if it were um, you know, le the member memorandums of understanding, um, that sort of thing, I think would help give some sense of um, 
confidence that it would be used not only by ourselves, but by others. Um, there's industrial groups that are looking for um, what we would be thinking about um, in phase two. I think that gives you a little bit of time to find those and reach out and see if there's partnerships available uh, and if there's interest and any kind of uh, additional support that you can get in writing. Um, perhaps you're already doing some of that work. I see you feverishly looking through papers. So um, if you have, I'm happy to hear that too. But I, I agree, I think it needs to be looked at as a two-year phase thing with the um, burn tower being the priority as part of the budget, recognizing that mm -hmm. there is close to half a million dollars that's being fundraised on the backs of our volunteer firefighters that have went out and helped other communities. And I remember having those discussions as part of the fire committee. And if I were, if we talk about fundraising, our own staff have went out and they've got a third of this. That's impressive. So I would support a two year approach. Thank you. Councillor Vandermeer. Uh, yes, um, there's been a few comments about um, you know, other municipalities, the use and whether they would invest in something. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I would uh, agree with those other comments that uh, we do need to investigate and we need to talk to these other municipalities. Um, there's no need and it makes no sense to duplicate and have three or four facilities around central Alberta that do the same thing. We need, if we're going to build something, make it, uh, make it the missing piece that's not being done in central Alberta. Um, or, you know, if, if, as an example, you could talk four, four or five municipalities into a contributing capital to a facility in Leslieville, that would be terrific. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, to to have these burn towers sprinkled around Central Alberta makes no sense to me whatsoever. And uh, uh, we just need to cooperate, keep the capital down, and uh, either share capital, put some capital into somebody else's, or have them put money into ours or get some commitment that uh, if any one party is putting up the capital to build one of these things, that uh, the other municipalities say, yeah, we'll, uh, we will use it, because that's better than building our own. It makes no sense to duplicate. Please. So what I'm hearing from council is spread the 1.4 over two years, but look to neighboring municipalities for some type of partnership, either in the capital. We do not want three burn towers built within central Alberta. That would be uh, not a good use of resources. Is that the consensus? No, I don't uh, agree with spending 1.4 over two years. That is not uh, anywhere near what I was proposing. I. I am uh, quite willing to look at a facility that is known to get support from outside. And uh, other than that, I think we need to start slow and build, uh, build some component of it this year and some next year. But the burn tower itself, uh, no, not until we've got more information. Councillor Lang. I just want to say that I need more information to put any dollars on this. If, if other areas are not going to be doing this, then yes, I, I'm probably going to be okay. I'm thinking more like five years, just given our um, assessments coming down from the province. Um, build it in stages. Um, but if other neighboring municipalities are going to be doing this, this makes absolutely no sense. I'd rather put in some dollars for a little bit of capital for them and lower our training costs or rental costs, something like that. But without more information, I, I can't put any more dollars in right now. So what you thought you heard council say, that was not 
where I was, Reef. So, once again, we need to give administration a number. So what is the number? The number I heard was Cami, or Councillor Laird, and Councillor Duncan saying 1.4 spread over two years. I heard Councillor Vandermeer say 200,000 total, which wouldn't even get the, uh, the road and the hydrant set up. So we need to give them a number so that they can do the work and come back to us at budget. What is the number? If you have a different number other than the 1.4, I would ask that council please be specific so we can deal with the number. Councilor Vandermeer. Just to clarify, um, um, with the information I have, I could go to 200. The problem is that you're asking to give a number with very little or almost no information on, on how it would be used and how it would be justified. Um, so I, I think that until um, administration does their homework in dealing with other municipalities in the area, because the information that came back from CP was unsatisfactory in my mind. Uh, so please um, bring back some information so that you know you have a number that could be supported. Uh, as Councillor Lang has, has mentioned, I mean, without without information, it's hard to you know just pick a number out of the sky and say this is what we want to target because the justification has not been provided. Councillor Lang. I just want to make a comment too. It seems when dollars are put in budget, this council seems to think, well, it's a definite go ahead. And that's why I'm really leery about putting any dollars in budget because I need my questions answered. I need to know are other municipalities going to support this. I need to know how many are going to be popping up around central Alberta. I detest duplication. It is a total waste of tax dollars. And as much as I'd like to see it here, if, the, if we're going to be the one and only in central Alberta, I'll jump on board with this 100%. Councillor Duncan. Okay. Um, and I, I'd be okay if this came back, even if this is an, a public meeting today, if we could look at this again at, at a future council meeting before budget as well, if there's more information to be brought forward. Um, but I go back to my last point. I, I think it'll be very difficult to get commitment out of other municipalities for, may or may not, but, um, but at least we can ask the questions and or maybe even get, at least get some direction on, on their training requirements and, and the type of facility that would be attractive as well. Because we're, maybe this is more than is needed. We don't know that for sure. It, it probably is in terms of rural municipalities, but not the urban ones. So. Uh, I'm willing to look at it again, but I think we need to look at it again before budget to allow staff time to get come back with some numbers for us at budget. Okay. So the question for Minister Christine. I apologize uh, if I interrupted you, Reef. Uh, just wanted to to say we've done a little of the preliminary work in terms of reaching out, putting those feelers out to our municipal counterparts. Uh, I didn't want to name them, saying who'd use it, who wouldn't, because of, again, it's an email or a conversation, not a commitment. So I can't guarantee it, just like I can't guarantee there won't be another fire training building built in another municipality, because that's outside of our control scope. Um, and certainly I expect there would be. I don't imagine City of Red Deer is going to travel to to Clearwater County, perhaps. They would... Perhaps they would for certain components, um, maybe in the interim. I, I don't know. I feel like uh, the likelihood of one being built in central Alberta in the, in the Highway 2 corridor is probably high. Um, so I can't commit that we are the only one. Um, but certainly the, the focus of the training center, the, the tower for, um, for use was to be for use for our firefighters first. So that was kind of our intent when uh, this proposal came through. All of the other partnership possibilities, um, hopefully they come to fruition. And again, I kind of mentioned the chicken and the egg. It puts us in a tough spot if we don't know what we are able to build. Uh, we, can't, we can't market it or go out there and say, you know, this is the four-story tower we're building. This is what it's going to look like by 2022. Um, and then now, perhaps, here's our fee schedule. Uh, I know one of the counties we talked to that's in our central region said, depending on what you charge us to use it. Yeah, we definitely would use it, but what are you going to charge us? Well, we don't know that yet. So um, certainly there's been some indication, like I said, from uh, several of the rural municipalities. 
uh, some, some industry, um, rail industry as well, uh, First Nations communities that are in our area. So I, I do think that once we build something, and it depends on the scope, um, if, if it's scope to the vision that's in front of the committee today, uh, I do think it'll be a well-utilized facility. But again, I don't have anything on paper that guarantees usage by any means, and I don't think we'll be able to get that other than a, an email saying, yeah, sure, I'd probably use that if you didn't charge me too much. So um, I'm sorry that I don't meet the, the expectation in terms of getting that level of information yet, but I do think it'll be easier to get to once we have something concrete in budget, um, whether it's a phased approach. Uh, which would be, I think, more than we have today to go out with. Councillor Vandinger. Yeah, just to follow up on your comment about, uh, you know, maybe a municipality would use it if you don't charge too much. Well, you know, you can't ask the question. Um, you, know, you know, you're saying you don't know what you would charge, but you have to have an idea of what you would charge so that you can justify this thing. Um, and... Uh, you can also simply ask that municipality, of course, you know, what is too much? Get, get a feel for what is acceptable in terms of the amount of usage that they might do, take and uh, what might be a reasonable number for them to contribute, either capital, which is also, in my mind, better than usage, if you can get a capital contribution and then they pay nothing for usage. Uh, I, would, I would personally favor that. Uh, capital contributions first, then uh, if you think it's, it, I mean, you've got a diagram, you want us to uh, say this is an attractive thing and it might be used or useful, well, they would also be able to say, well, yeah, it looks interesting to us and uh, right now we, we pay somebody a certain amount for an inferior to this facility and therefore, you know, we'd be willing to pay that amount or, or something a little bit more. Uh, I'm sure there's a way of having this conversation and getting a, an idea of the, uh, of, of the real interest because I think it's important that Council um, knows what the real interest out there. To build something on spec and then you come back three years later and say, well, there's nobody using it and somebody built something else down the road 30 miles. And that's uh, not a good scenario. So getting back to the staff recommendation, administration requires a number. I've heard Councillor Vandermeer say $200,000. I have heard Councillor Duncan and Councillor Laird say 1.4, the full amount over two years. Those are the only two numbers that we've discussed. We've had discussion that went around, but admin needs a number. So are there any other numbers that people would like to bring to the table? Councillor Lang. So I suggest the build out over five years if we do it. So doing the math that comes to about less than 300,000, but I'll say 300,000 for a number. Okay, thank you for giving us a number. Comments on any of those three numbers? Because we will require a motion for a number. Councillor Duncan. Burn tower is a priority. We need to come up, that's probably the number we need to come up with. So if 678 is not acceptable, then we would have to give them a number for a burn tower scaled back version, or if, if there's a way they can phase that or something too. But, um, well, I'm looking at the numbers and we need 114,000 for the underground and the hydrants. $44,000 for the road infrastructure and six hundred and seventy-five dollars for the burn tower. And to me, that would have to be your minimum amount if the burn tower is important because it, it would make no sense to have the burn tower but no hydrants so you could not train with it. So we're looking at, I'm not even going to attempt to do math in my head, you know, eight fifty, eight seventy-five. dollars So basically half of... Yeah, for year one. So we've got three numbers. Would uh, Councillor Vandermeer? Uh, Ray of yours saying that we have to give a number. I submit we do not have to give a number. Uh, administration has asked for a number. 
what some of us have said is that um, you're asking for a number with inadequate backup information. We've suggested you go back, talk to municipalities. We've got some indication from industry that's not very encouraging to me. Uh, we need better justification, and uh, when, we, when we have the next meeting on this, uh, we can decide then on a number is what I would recommend. My concern with going out to other municipalities without us having a number and a plan, we're asking the, the administration to go ask, well, we might or might not have a training facility in one, two, or five years, and it might or might not have these components. Would you be interested in using it? Well, no one is going to say yes to that. And before we send our administration out to talk to other municipalities, we need to give them a product to sell to other municipalities. And if we don't have a product to sell, no one's going to buy. So I'll get back to the staff recommendation that administration is asking for a number. So would someone care to make a motion for a number so we can further focus our discussion? Councillor Vandermeer. Uh, Reeve, uh, respectfully, I disagree with your comment that uh, you have to have something to sell. You have a concept to sell, uh, and uh, uh, you know you, you've, you've, you've got a diagram. And I mean, it could be built faster if if people want it, uh, and also if municipalities are willing to put money into this. Uh, I guess. I, I come back and focus on uh, the fact that every municipality is going to be watching their dollars and cents very carefully. They're all under pressure. Um, um, therefore, if this is a needed type of facility, it should be attractive to other municipalities to use it. Uh, if it is not needed at all, they will tell you that, uh, and uh, or they will uh, offer to put some money into it so that it can be done jointly. Cooperative efforts, and I guess I, I would encourage the administration to focus on that. Uh, I think it's much preferable to have a cooperative uh, facility where a number of municipalities put in a percentage of the total capital and get usage from it rather than building. If this is a needed thing, they should be willing to do that rather than put money out and build their own. I would ask Councillor Vandermeer to, you know, let's role play for a bit. If we had a, a municipality, a neighboring municipality, sitting as a delegation asking for a commitment to a project that that municipality did not have a solid vision for, a solid budget, we would say, do your homework and then come back to us. So by asking administration to go out and try to get municipal partners, when we do not have a plan, or it sounds like a vision for the project, I can guarantee you the, the response will be no, because that's what our response would be. Councilor Lougheed. I, I guess just for me, I'm, I'm looking here, we have nearly half a million dollars in reserve for a firefight or fire facility reserve, which was largely put in place by the efforts of, of the firefighting community, our regional firefighting community. This is something that will definitely impact the quality of the firefighting service here. Plus, we've also uh, indicated um, $100,000 in the 2020 budget already committed to the SEP. That approach is $600,000 towards this. If we were looking at a two-year phased program, that would just, the simple math would say $1.2 million for, for a facility. That might get us to where we need to be. It doesn't, doesn't uh, cover the absolute wish list of everybody, but it gives us a facility that is going to create um, leaps and bounds in the training opportunities here, as well as I think it will attract the interest of, of, of the neighboring municipalities that would be able to use a facility like this, as well as it, it will attract, it'll attract business, it'll attract, uh, I, I can tell you, um, just meeting with some of the people around the 
Condor community, there are people that have moved to the Condor community just to just because of the recent uh, infrastructure investment within that community. And that's, that's people that have moved there just specifically for that. This is something they do part-time in their spare time, but they've moved to that community just to access those facilities. So I think it's a positive for our community to invest in infrastructure for the future. We have nearly $600,000 already committed to this or available to be committed to this without any impact to future budgets. So we would be looking at even a scaled thing over two or three or five years of, of another $600,000. Just, just a thought. So back to the staff recommendation. Uh, we need to give a number to administration so they can prepare for the capital budget in 2021. 1 1.4 over 2, a total of 200,000, or was it 300,000 for five years? Would a councillor care to make a motion on one of those proposals so we can please move on? Councillor Laird. I will go ahead and make the motion um, that we do this $1.4 million project over a two-year phase with the priority on the burn tower. Thank you for making a motion. Well, it may expedite the process. Any further discussion on the motion at hand or on the table? Councillor Duncan. Um, my only comment would be that administration continues to look into the possibility of partnerships and, and if this type of facility, is it attractive as a rental or a partnership to other communities? And that will help us decide at budget time if we need to readjust then. Okay. Councillor Laird. I would consider Councillor uh, Duncan's suggestion as a friendly amendment that uh, staff continue to work on uh, partnerships uh, and um, commitments from other areas, uh, both municipal and industrial. Thank you. Councillor Lang. Um, unfortunately, I will not be voting in favour of this motion. Um, without the information I need, I cannot in good faith vote in favour, knowing that our policing is going to be increasing by a million and knowing that our tax revenues are going to be decreasing by three million to thirteen million. Um, this unfortunately, without the information needed, is not a priority for me. So administrations, you have, uh, I know you've been taking notes, do you have a list of the concerns that Councillor Lang has raised? Um, I definitely have the, um, the noted, the investigate partnerships. I think if, um, if and when budget is approved for this project in December, that would be um, something we could go forward with into our municipal partners and say, we have funding, we're building this, are you gonna come or not? Um, in the interim, we can certainly get that list of municipal counterparts or industry counterparts that based on a certain plan and we ha we're gonna have to go back perhaps to the table and, and look at that plan uh, again um, and make sure that we have at least, you know, here's our idea, this is what we're, our vision is gonna potentially look like and we could probably get um, a collective of emails or phone conversations that says that yay or nay for each municipality in the region. Um, in terms of the other questions, um, I'm not sure that I, I captured um, all of them, but in terms of uh, the types of training, I think we laid out in the proposal document what the, the fire training grounds would be used for, how our firefighters would train on those facilities. We could certainly add to that in the future. Um, but if there's anything else that uh, the committee wishes in terms of information for us to come back at budget time, we can certainly prepare that. Okay. Councillor Vandermeer. Yes, uh, thank you. In uh, regards to your uh, comment, Christine, that uh, um, you'll be able to go out and say to these other municipalities that you're going to build it. By so doing, you're removing all possibility that another municipality will make a capital contribution to this. 
I think it's absolutely backwards, the approach, to say we're going to build this and, you know, come hell or high water, we're going to build it whether you participate or not, we don't care. And therefore, we may not even care how much uh, the hourly rate is that you'd be willing to contribute. You need to leave uncertainty as to whether it'll go ahead. And you need their, uh, their indication that it would be attractive. Uh, and if you come back and nobody's, uh, you know, there's no interest from outside, that's, that's information that's valuable to this council as well. But it's very, very valuable if you come back saying that, you know, three other municipalities need something like this. One of them is contemplating building something like this and uh, that maybe we can get together and solve this on a more regional basis. Thank you. Councillor Lang. I just want to make one more comment. In times like this, I do not believe we should be increasing our budget. I do not think we need to take away from this but, uh, what we have in our reserves for this bill, but we could put it on hold. Given the fact now that four days of the year we're going to Red Deer, that's about $7,200. And this is not the year to be increasing that. <laughs> So, Councillor Vandermeer, a question for you. Do you have a number that you would be looking at administration to get commitments out of other municipalities? You know, I know that it's going to be impossible to get anything before December. But is it, you know, are you looking at a 50% investment from other municipalities? Uh, a 25% investment? I think if we are going to be asking administration for something, we need to give them the criteria of what we're looking for. There's no definitive number. I want to know the level of interest by other municipalities in, in twofold. Um, I would very much prefer, as I mentioned, a capital contribution. Um, however, if, uh, if it could be translated into a firm usage arrangement, that starts to give you some uh, um, viability parameters for this. Um, right now, we can, uh, we can uh, send our people away for four days a year and cover all the bases within the current operating budget. So we're talking about doing a lot more training. That's going to run our budget up. And, uh, you know, it's nice to have. Is it, an you know, is it essential that the additional training take place? I don't know. Uh, in terms of meeting the requirements, we're, we're meeting them now. But um, uh, we don't, you know, you can talk to people without giving them a, you know, we want 25% from you. Uh, if you find that you can even get 10 or 15%, that would be helpful because uh, it, it may be something that would be um, more uh, um, interesting to a higher number of, of parties, so you know you don't need to, you don't need to be specific. You need to have uh, have uh, good open dialogue and a concept. You have the concept already identified. You know what the total cost is. You don't need any more to have a conversation with people as to is this interesting to you. You know you you have definition. You have de definition of what the project looks like. And um, all you need to find out is if they want to go on their own or if something like this is interesting either in terms of a capital contribution. And again, I don't think you should say we're going to do it come hell or high water. Uh, you need to find out if you can get a capital contribution and they would have usage of it. I guess the reason for my question was, is there a number that Currently, the motion is for 1.4 over 2. If we are so requiring other municipal partners, is it a matter of us saying we will commit 
you know, the fire reserve is 484, maybe Clearwater County would kick in an additional 484 to match the work of the firefighters, and then we required another $500,000 from municipal partners to go forward with this. I'm just trying to give us a specific action for administration to take because what where we are is so vague, I think we're just asking for no success unless we say we're going to fund it all. Maybe I rambled on there and I'm not clear. Time for another coffee. But we cannot just leave question marks for admin to guess what our intentions are and we need to be crystal clear with them or else we're setting them up for failure. So if there is a specific number from municipal partners that you're looking for, it is time for you, it is time for this council to, to get that before we vote on a motion for 1.4 over two years. Councillor Duncan. My perspective on the municipal partners would be that it would just create all kinds of complications. Okay. We're, uh, how do you administer something like, depending on the level of partnership, of course, uh, you know, small capital contribution is, you probably wouldn't have much say, but given the difficulty we've had to have a fire agreement within our own region, I, to stretch that outside for even a training facility, especially when you have urban and rural municipalities who have different probably wants and needs, it's going to be very difficult, I think, to, to manage that. And, you know, I, I say, I go back to my original that we would, for budgetary purpose, we would fund this ourselves, but definitely find out from other municipalities the flavor of their interests for training, their needs for training. And if what, you know, I, I'm making the assumption here that, that we've come up with this plan as being maybe a bit of a Cadillac, I don't know, it's, it's, but it's a plan that satisfies all our training requirements. It's probably going to satisfy the training requirements of all the other rurals for sure and small urbans, I'm guessing, out there, whether or not Red Deer is attractive or not. Probably the question for them is, is travel and if current conditions, if they're willing to invest in their own system, in their own training facility or not. But I, you know, I say I, I'm willing to put the numbers in budget and I would think we would look at this as our own facility and rent it out as opposed to capital. I think we have to set those rental rates such that we're looking at least a re some return over, and we would pick, have to pick a year, whether it's 10, 20, 30 year return on this, but that's where we would go with that. Councillor Laird. Um, yes, uh, just building on what Councillor Duncan uh, indicated, um, without a doubt, I mean, if I were being uh, asked that from another municipality of what capital I would at a municipal level put in another municipality, um, I think it'd be a pretty quick and short answer of no, but we may have an interest in using the facility. Uh, and I would suggest from a competitive or marketing uh, process, we already have a number of whatever uh, Red Deer is at $1,800 a day. So I mean, if we're in that ballpark, I would suggest to you, um, have we got a better facility? Have we got one that's comparable, et cetera? And it's easy to go from there. I think those are the numbers that staff could probably start with and work on. Phase two, on the second year, when we start to get into what some of the industrial and hazmat uh, additional props, including um, vehicle extrication, that is the one that will become far more, um, I'll say, leverageable with our industrial partners uh, in the area. That's where you'll find um, donations in kind. Um, the rail car is a prime example. Um, there's other industrial uh, partners who need to train. They are having a, a heck of a time right now. They have to go to get the really um, advanced training. They'll continue to go to Texas. But in Alberta, there are some pretty limitations around that. And in central Alberta, it is almost nil. Now, I, I'm probably speaking beyond uh, where I should be, but that is uh, what I've seen. And I think there's an opportunity for staff to really reach out about phase two on a capital and in-kind and definitely use. I think that's where we'll see some uh, interesting uh, discussions happen. Um, I think that the, the motion I have before council is a solid way forward. It would allow staff um, to then 
work work around the budget and ha start to have those important conversations with potential partners, even if it's in simply use. Councillor Lang. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Liar. You made a very good point. Um, I have a question here. Um, Councillor Vandermeer made this comment um, that the more training you do, we pay these volunteers for their training, um, so the more it increases our budget. So I'm just wondering with this facility, there'd probably be more training that you would be giving than normal, which would increase our budget more than in the past. And I'm also wondering, when I look at this list of uh, search and rescue, high angle rescue and all that, are you, do you offer training here in Clearwater County that is more so than other municipalities in Alberta? Like, the, uh, are, are you offering more than the basic training? Are we paying our volunteers for more than the basic training they're required to do to do their jobs? If I could interrupt, it's, 11 o'clock, we have a motion on the table, and is, that is an excellent question, but it's not applicable to the motion we have. Um, yeah, I believe it is. How is it applicable well, to Well, it motion? has to do with dollars. So I, I just, and it's related to the training. If our firefighters are going to train at this facility, and if this facility is going to create more training, it's going to increase our dollars which is something council needs to consider when we can go to Red Deer for $7,200 a year. So, and this is a question I think I'm entitled to have answered as a counselor, if we are giving more training than the basic training needed. I've never had that question in seven years. Okay. Um, I think there was two questions. The first question, would, would that increase our training budget year over year because we're doing more training? I would argue that it would be the same uh, or relatively the same because we're already doing a weekly training night. We're already training our firefighters. It'd just be a different training opportunity, if that makes sense. Um, and training, uh, and council will see this and I'll talk further about it in our upcoming workshop next week. Um, but we're, we're going to be changing the format of the, the regional fire budget to break it out mm -hmm. by different areas of function, uh, response and training, um, that sort of thing. That will be further broken out for councils, uh, the three councils information. So you can see, but training is our largest cost area already. Um, and in terms of the second question, in terms of service level, we do have a broad uh, service level that's agreed to under our intermunicipal agreement. Our firefighters are well trained, and I know Chief DBN would probably echo this, um, that they um, are very well trained for all of the services we provide. I, I don't think we go uh, above and beyond our service level in terms of the types of training. Uh, the only time we would do extra training outside of what's already prescribed under our agreement is if something like uh, industry comes to us with an opportunity. Uh, I know that happens in the hazmat world uh, where the oil and gas industry will say, hey, we want to train your firefighters. This is the type of training. Will you send some? Uh, we had a recent one, uh, the town of Rocky Mountain House passed along to us from Atco Gas. They said, you know, we can do firefighter training for um, natural gas line awareness uh, level training. So there are some opportunities where we do go beyond that service level just uh, to ha enhance our knowledge base, but it's typically with a grant or a in kind from an industry provider. I think you kind of answered my question. My question is, do we offer more training to our firefighters than the majority of municipalities in rural Alberta? I'm not talking about the urbans. I'm talking about the rurals. Can I, that question, it is a, a very appropriate question, but not for the motion on the table. If we are, I don't think this is the time for us to be getting into questions about the service levels of an intermunicipal fire agreement with the town of Rocky Mountain House. The question, what is the motion on the table right now? So it, thank you, Repoven. It's a little rough, but um, I have that the committee of a whole recommends that council approves a two-year phase, two phase approach of the 1.4 million for the Lessieville firefighting training grounds with priority on the burn tower and that administration conti continues to look into prospective par partnerships and commitments from external, and then I have municipal and industrial interest. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Councillor Vandermeer. 
Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on Council Laird's uh, comments about the uh, hazmat training and the possibility that industry and other municipalities might in fact find that uh, uh, one of the more appealing <clears throat> features of the overall project. So I was wondering, uh, Council Laird, if uh, in fact, uh, does that comment uh, point that perhaps we've got the cart before the horse, that maybe the more important um, project for the first year would be something, some components, component or components of the uh, gravel and concrete pads, and that the burn tower should in fact, could in fact, under your proposal, be uh, made in, into the second year uh, contingent upon the studies and the investigations that the administration will undertake uh, with other municipalities and industry. <clears throat> Councillor Laird. Um, thank you, Claire. Uh, Councillor Vandermeer. How, um, and I recognize where you're going with that. Um, However, what I, I'm basing my motion on is um, staff's recommendation that their priority is the burn tower based on discussions they've had with the firefighters and their um, needs within the service, and that that would allow staff uh, the given time it would need to find those partnerships, if there are any, for the phase two of that. That's why I put them in that order. So I'll, I'll stay with the current order as, as indicated by priority uh, of what I heard from staff. Okay, so I'd like to ask the question. We just had the motion read back. Mr. Emmons, a, a comment. Thank you, Revolven. Um, maybe just for clarity, I wouldn't mind uh, trying to paraphrase what I heard and further address Councillor Lang's question. Um, so. I'm looking for correction as well. What I heard was regional fire does not go above and beyond uh, the training required. It is simply based on the service levels mutually agreed upon by the three municipalities. Um, and based on those agreed service levels, the adequate training is provided. And I think what's behind the discussion I'm hearing, administration took this from a perspective that this was first and foremost for our firefighters and then any partnerships would augment um, this facility. Um, and I hear the discussion being those partnerships hinge on the decision. Um, and that is a different philosophy than what administration took to investigate. So we would have to carry forward with a different philosophy uh, to investigate and go forward again. I will ask the question. All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion carries five to two. We'll be taking a break for 15 minutes and coming back at 1125.
Okay, I'd like to call the meeting back to order. Agenda item 6.1, Public Works, Clearwater County Dry Hydrant, Storm Pond, and Water Storage Tanks. Good morning, committee members. As we begin to prepare for budget 2021 and beyond, Public Works operations, along with emergency and legislative services, are bringing before you an agenda item which in just a little bit will be presented to you by Kate Reglan, our project technologist, as she has been the lead on this project. As such, what we are looking for is for the Strategic Planning Committee to provide guidance and consensus regarding upgrading each of the Clearwater County's dry hydrants, storm ponds, and water storage tanks. Once that guidance has been provided, administration will communicate to Clearwater County Council during budget deliberations, typically mid-December, on the costs associated with the upgrades, if indeed that is the committee's consensus. I will now turn it over to Kate. Good morning. So Clearwater County has 13 dry hydrant, storm pond, and water storage tanks throughout the county. Um, they are listed by location and system in the table on the agenda item. Um, the systems are designed to assist with access to water fire suppression and they're mainly located in multi-lot subdivisions. Administration is working with WSP Engineering to review each system and their current functionality. And in August 2020, WSP completed site visits and were able to complete flow testing on 10 out of the 13 systems. Systems that were not tested, it was just due to access and availability. Um, throughout their investigation, to reach the recommended 70 PSI from the National Fire Protection Association, which is outlined in our current policy, the Rural Water Supply for Fire Protection Multi-Lot Subdivisions, all the sites except for the new Leslieville Public Services site would need to be upgraded. There is another document um, which would be recommended at 20 PSI, and currently there's two storage tank systems, which is Eagle Ridge and Raven Rise, which is the Nordic North subdivision, they would meet that standard. Um, we have a preliminary assessment on the hydrants and some preliminary recommendations to get those systems in current um, working conditions, whether it would be maintenance or a different use of the water itself as well. So administration is looking for guidance regarding upgrading each system to either meet the National Fire Protection Association code or a different documentation, the fire's underwriting survey standard, um, and per or perform further investigation and maintenance to the systems. Operationally, the fire service water access plans include other means to access water for fire suppression, including portable pump systems or tender shuttle systems from existing wet hydrants in Caroline, Rocky Mountain House, and Nordic. Any further questions? Dialogue? Sorry, I didn't know if you need that. Councillor Duncan. Um, so the dry hydrants, the reason they're not working, is that just the size of the piping, or are they plugged off, or are they... There's a variety of issues. Um, some of the systems, the lift is too great. Typically, the trucks will pull at a 20-foot lift as a recommendation. Um, some of the hydrants have a 40-foot lift. Some, they do believe it is the vegetation, and that would be further investigation. We would have to drain the ponds, um, look at the screens, and a lot of the recommendations they have is just to add a storage tank so you can bring the lift higher for the trucks to pull from. So Some there's a different pumping system, this is the storage tank, and then the truck can access the storage tank. Yeah. Um, storage tanks, are they viable in winter? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the storage tank is not above ground, then it's below, yeah, it's hopefully below, below frost, just, just within the 20 feet system. lift level of the, okay. Yeah, and we would have to, the recommendation maintenance on storage tanks would be kind of, they would empty it and renew, refill the water every twice a year. Right. Because um, you'd get algae and sludge growth. May I continue one more question? Just, yes. Uh, I Googled a little bit last night, but there aren't any other options really, are there, in terms of 
like if, if we have these stormwater ponds and they are you know part of our reason for having stormwater ponds is for firefighting so we're kind of we're not going to be able to use them with the dry hydrant system or just pumping directly out of the pond then what's the rationale for even having stormwater ponds and all that expense you know we should be putting that money or having developers put that money into some other means of providing water um, in which case yeah you can we can investigate turnaround times and things from rocky to to other subdivisions or and my only other suggestion on that is that we now have around the county some of these you know quasi permanent at least um, fracking ponds that are out there that the one at the end of Everdale, there's one out east, but whether or not you know, we'd have to have some kind of agreement to access them or, as well, but they are certainly a large supply of water that's out there that, um, I, I don't know if it, you know, again, that's, I, I have to turn that over to staff, whether that's viable alternative, because for instance, Everdale, there's, or Meadow Ponds, the, the stormwater ponds there are probably almost equidistant from Rocky Mountain House and that pond at the end of the Everdale Road, so. There may it may not be a solution that I, I I would say it's a solution potentially for a localized fire down there, but it's probably not a solution for subdivisions to any for many subdivisions anyway. Thank you, Councillor Vandermeer. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, question, I guess, for the fire chief. Uh, so these. These uh, water storage ponds are not, uh, storm water ponds are not really uh, functioning very well as yet. Certainly uh, dry hydrants to them don't seem to be working. Um, we don't have tanks in many of these places, but currently, how do we address these issues? Uh, I presume it's uh, with tank trucks and uh, pumpers. Um, but uh, how are we doing it now, and uh, and uh, what is the immediate need? I mean, there's a, there's two standards here, and they're quite a bit different. One is a 70 psi, one is a 20 psi, and then you have a number of these areas served by some other process. Could you describe that for me? Absolutely, Councillor Vandermeer. What we've currently done is, uh, if council remembers back in 2017 budget for purchase in 2018, we purchased some high volume pumps, portable pumps for our tender trucks, which gives us a roughly about 450 gallons per minute per pump um, at the height of lift. And that was a rationale that we could put these pumps in at any point. Uh, two people can carry them down to the pond and at least we could supply water up to the truck. They're a little more of a high lift pump than our pumper trucks would do to provide 450 gallons a minute. And the idea was is when we get into a tender operation, typically we'll have four tenders operating. So that would give us the access to four pumps if required. And we could pretty much run up to 900 gallons if we ran two pumps to, to reload the tender units. Uh, we'll also uh, have on order as a new tender for a 3,600 gallon tender to give us some more water, A, out the gate, and then B, to build into that tender cycle. Um, and we look at other alternatives. Um, I know it was mentioned about coming back to Rocky Mountain House to use a pressurized hydrant. We get into the Nordegg area, there's hydrants on the south side of the highway, so we can tie into those to just build that tender cycle in off of a pressurized hydrant system, which is um, less of a hassle and, and more efficient and less challenging to, to get to. Uh, summertime, like we do use the portable pumps a fair little bit, um, depending where we are. We do have some agreements with industry partners, uh, Strachan, for an example, their gas plant. We've got water from the Strachan gas plant to be able to fight fires, and um, we've got some other ones around. DICORP has a uh, tank in the ground. So we've got some of those other alternatives. Councillor Lougheed. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Okay. Deputy Reeve Swanson. I have some questions in regards to storm ponds, and, uh, and that is how often do they get cleaned, and what are the costs associated with that, and have we ever done that? So Public Works has not um, done any maintenance to these storm ponds. Moving forward, that's what we're kind of looking for is a maintenance plan so we can do the cleaning the vegetation the algae um, I know we have an issue with the fence at Cougar Ridge it keeps getting cut 
I don't know why. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at moving forward at doing. We have not in the past. We've drained one in 2017 in Tamarack Trail in Nordig, and that was so fire could do a further investigation on it. But that's public works extent. Okay. Supplements? Yes. Um, I guess from a bit of research that I've been doing, it's um, that, that is a huge expense to do the cleaning of those ponds. And depending on the use, uh, if they're not being used very often, the, the maintenance gets to be uh, a handful. So I would support more of the storage tank. I think that would be better in the long term. I don't, I mean, I know we need these. It, it's, how do you phase, to me it's, it's phase the storm, storm water ponds out. Because to me, it, they're, they're uh, a money hole, <laughs> like the, with ongoing maintenance, because it's, it's continuous things. So, um, I mean, if we had a, a a cover for them and could shelter them and you know a collection system of yeast troughs that would be awesome but we, we can't so um, I, I support the idea of doing more storage tank uh, ideas I think that is a better use of our uh, for costs and for maintenance so Councillor Vandermeer just uh, one more question for the chief um, we're kind of getting got close to it in the last discussion here, but you have other uh, facilities available. You, you mentioned you've, you're, uh, you've got a, a bigger tender. You can shuttle some um, water out. Can we um, use our current uh, tankage and, um, I guess, perhaps arrangements with tank truck companies to provide adequate uh, water without having many of these tanks and certainly doing away with the uh, stormwater ponds, which as Councillor uh, Swanson mentioned, is a very expensive proposition to maintain. Uh, so uh, do we have to do a lot or is this, or do, and do we have to put these tanks in at all? Councillor Vandermeer, I really like your questions. You always put me on the spot. Um, we do have some agreements with the tank truck companies around. Where we do get into the struggle is in the wintertime. Summertime, we're in really good shape. We've got a lot of water for the majority of our county, and the tank truck operators do have trucks stored full of water in reserve. When we get into the winter is where we start to have a little more of a challenge. Um, Unfortunately, you know, we get that minus 40 degree temperature. That's typically when we get these, these structure fires that are a challenge on everything. Um, so we do have that in play. It's just the winter that's a challenge. And even that, in three and a half years here, I think we've went to two storm ponds with portable pumps to pull water out of. So very minimal. Um, but I do want to come back around and talk about uh, Councillor Swanson's comment. When you're looking at a rule of thumb with these dry hydrants with a liner, you're looking 9 to 10 to 12 inches of silt annually is what they collect. So it does build quite a bit. Does that answer your question as well, Councillor Vandermeer? Well, uh, it sort of does. Uh, what you just described is that uh, um, you've got pretty good coverage in the summertime. My observation would be that um, most of your fires are in the summertime. That's when you need water. So what you, I think, said was that, uh, uh, you know, getting water there for a structure fire in the winter is not so easy. Uh, I would observe that uh, if you have a structure fire in the winter, um, it's far less likely that there will be surrounding uh, uh, damage. It, you know, in, in, in winter conditions with snow on the ground. So, in, and also in most cases, by the time you get to a fire, and if it's truly, truly on fire when reported, um, you're not going to probably put it out anyway. Or if you do, you've wrecked the building with water and ice by that time. So, uh, um, do we need a lot more water in the wintertime than what you can deliver with your uh, pumpers and tenders to uh, catch a fire at 
at the at the outset uh, because the, the ability to propagate a fire through other buildings and through the through the area in the winter time is so much diminished. Uh, I guess I'm wondering if if we need to invest in any. Ultimately, my question is: Do we need to invest in any tanks at all? Can we use what we have in the way we do it? I, I think an evaluation of the county and where we do water and where some of our challenges come in. Maybe we do have to invest in a few tanks uh, once we take a look at the overall county and what we've got. We know Lesseyville Condor, we've got really good water supply there with the new Condor building and the Lessie building coming online. We'll have good water supply on that side of the county. Um, north, uh, I'm not sure. And out west, um, again, we do have the hydrant system on the south side of Nordag. There's nothing on the north side, so having one up in the north side would be, would be a nice addition. But I think a, a overall evaluation of where we may have water shortages within the county would, would kind of steer that direction. Councillor Laird. Um, yes, I think it's a great course of action to look at the and evaluate the water needs uh, in the county with regard to where our assets are and what you're trying to protect. Um, with regard to just a little history on why ponds were looked at, um, recognizing, yes, they are additional um, maintenance. Uh, first of all, the ponds were looked at as not only something that would be used for structural um, protection, but also something that the helicopters could dip out of for wildland use. So that's where some of the trade-offs come with maintenance. Have there been any maintenance? None in my time. Um, was it needed? Absolutely. Were there some that were installed that didn't meet the level of criteria? Yes. So there's some history on that. Um, I see DICORP wasn't included on the list, but it's one that's accessible for sure. Um, some of these, the maintenance on these ones that are owned by other companies, that's a challenge. Um, I think that the evaluation of the water needs uh, uh, and a study or whatever and maintenance, I think that would be very beneficial for us. Um, as for these other numbers, I'm, I'm not sure how they were, how they we came to that. And I do have one question is how much uh, uh, or are, are we planning for budget or are you just looking for some direction so that you can figure that out? I, I need, <laughs> I'm curious. Yep. Yes, that's that's correct. As of right now, we don't have any numbers, uh, Councilor Laird. Um, so indeed, we're looking for direction uh, from this committee, uh, guidance and consensus, and that way then um, come budget deliberations in December, we can provide you with uh, an, a number to consider for uh, budget. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lang. Um, Steve, you had mentioned that perhaps having a, a hydrant or something on the north side of Nordegg may be beneficial. I've had emails of concerns regarding Nordegg and the hydrants on the north side not working. I guess my question is, um, are the ones on the south side that you mentioned, are they sufficient and are they pressurized? And um, what is the gallons per minute or the output of them? Uh, Councillor Lang, they are pressurized on the south side and they are sufficient. We are working with Nordeg Public Works on getting some um, flow testing done out there. We we're hoping to get it done this year. Uh, we're just trying to coordinate on what that looks like to get it completed. Um, we're not 100% sure with the gallonage currently, but we want to get that number nailed down. And I know Public Works and Planning have talked about even painting the hydrants to meet the NFPA color coding, which just kind of makes it easier for us to identify if we're going to hook onto them. If, is it a primary main or is it a distributor? And what is that size of the line, or line and how much water can we get out of it? So we are working on that and hope to have the flow testing done yet this fall. Councillor Duncan. I guess for me on this, I, I think say it's appropriate that we take a look at where we need the water here in the county. I, I think I would be looking at 
you know, places like Misty Valley, I don't see a way out of not having something out there. Uh, but, you know, a hard look at even Paderni's and, and Nordig, we've got, you know, numerous hydrants on the north side. Can, why don't we just have one good one over there as opposed to three that are, you know, I would rather spend extra money on one and, and phase out two others as opposed to trying to maintain three, you know, depending on the, on the water they produce I and mean, pick the best one that will give you your appropriate water there and just, like I say, to cut down on the number of dry hydrants if we can. And if it's, if it becomes, if we have the ability with these increased tankers and tender sizes to service even a meadow ponds from Rocky as opposed to the cost of, especially that one is, is probably still in good shape because it's new, but eventually it will require maintenance, right? So we either, we either have to go into a maintenance program on something like meadow ponds and build that into the budget. Um, and maybe there's maintenance things we can do that either spread that cost out or reduce the, you know, waiting till we get three feet of silt in there is, a, is maybe not the best route as opposed to trying to deal with, some, deal with it somehow every, every year, even if that's just control of vegetation or something like that that's plugging up. So I, I would look at this as a, there's probably no way out in some of these far reaching areas to not have a tank or a, or a dry hydrant, but that maybe that's appropriate with the in better technology, better truck systems we have now that we can tender from, from and better roads to tender from town as opposed to uh, trying to have something everywhere close. But I would look to administration to provide the, you know, the plus minus there or the, or the, the potential cost in terms of time and, and effort and money. I know for me, it's making sure we have adequate water to make sure that the residents of Clearwater County are protected and then balance that with the cheapest cost. You know, you want to have a network of dry ponds that hopefully you never have to use. But you can't afford everything, so just adequate water at the lowest cost po possible to the taxpayer. Any further comments on this? And I'll ask administration, any further questions or direction you need from council? Good. I don't believe we need a motion then for that one. As long as administration feels good with that information. Councillor Laird. I actually had one question. Um, you commented uh, early in your presentation that um, different use of water itself on the ponds. What did that mean? What we're kind of thinking, and again, we're still in the preliminary stages of the discussions about maintenance and that, is if, so I'll give us that, Beaver Creek is probably the worst one right now. Mm -hmm. um, we can't get anything off of that. And we don't want to necessarily abandon that body of water, but maybe a different reuse. Like it wouldn't be necessarily a dry hydrant that the trucks would pump off of, but like you said, it would still be there for helicopter use. So there still might be maintenance associated with it, but we won't label it a dry hydrant for the trucks to pump from. Thank you. I, I was just thinking just, yeah, something the to use, use itself. Yeah. I, it sounds like a different operational access. Uh, so you've got storage areas, such as what Councillor Duncan had indicated, if you can get some sort of access permit for um, the, I'm going to say it, the bad word, fracking, water that's uh, being held. Um, there's multiple um, Poseidons in, uh, in some of the West Country uh, that are full of water that are uh, another option uh, that might be looked at uh, when you do, I'm thinking, some sort of survey or study uh, or both. Um, so thank you for clarifying that it's more just operational access, not we're going to use the water for something else. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And mapping that, I think, would be very beneficial. Deputy Reeves Swanson. Um, yeah, just going off of the comments of Council Laird in regards to industry and the, and the water storage that they're doing, understanding that it is a, a bit of a slippery slope because they have had a water diversion to fill that 
from the existing water system, so they may not be too apt, other than in an emergency, uh, to, you know, give give away that water. I'll just say, uh, but I mean, if it's sitting there too, uh, I'm sure they've had to treat it. If it's just sitting there as well too, so because the we know that there's a lot of uh, um, activity that's that's shut, you know, it's been, been suspended for a bit until uh, there's some uh, level of the economy comes back. So, but uh, yeah, for what's sitting there, they, they may be apt to say, yeah, let's let's move it along and who knows, but just, just for information, I guess. Councillor Vandermeer. Uh, just to add to Councillor Swanson's uh, comment about these, these huge ponds, uh, I would think it's a great opportunity for the industry to uh, to contribute, to, and it's it's a uh, it's a infinitesimal, at least small amount of water that we could ever use out of one of those ponds. So, it's a contribution to the community that they could make, and it would cost them nothing really to do. So, I would hope that some dialogue can take place, and that uh, some access could be achieved. Thank you. So, just, just one short comment on, uh, you've heard the Poseidons, that's the, the temporary storage tanks on the lease sites, just that those are often, you can't guarantee you can get in there, those are sites are often wet, muddy sites, um, difficult to access for our equipment. Kurt? So just for clarification purposes, I, what I've heard then is to look and evaluate our water needs throughout the county and balance that with the most economical cost to provide this water. Is that correct? Okay. I see head nods. Uh, Councillor Larry. Um, if I may, I would think that we would need some sort of uh, process for maintenance of what we currently have as well, or evaluation. I mean, we've got a partial evaluation, but you need to have a plan moving forward on, on uh, that goes with what we currently have. Because I'm, I'm hearing words of change the access options, and um, I think that that kind of goes hand in glove with the maintenance side of things. I know it's been something that's always been a challenge. Clear as mud, Mr. Magnus? Yep. Good. Okay, it is 10 to 12, and I see, yes. Rehoven, can I suggest um, perhaps maybe a, um, a resolution that the committee recommends including costs of Clearwater County dry hydrant storm ponds and water storage tanks in the 2021 budget? Is there a councillor who would care to make, or a committee member who would care to make that motion? Deputy B. Swanson, all in favor? Motion carries 7 to 0. Thank you. It's 10 to 12. Instead of starting the next item, the Clearwater County Regional Wastewater System, we'll take a break for lunch and we will be back here at 1230.
12.38 p.m. I'll call the meeting back to order. We are on item 6.2, Clearwater County Regional Wastewater System. Okay. Thank you, Council. So back in 2018, uh, the Council discussed uh, with administration about the possibility of having a regional wastewater facility to accommodate residents, businesses, and hamlets within our region. Uh, further to that conversation, Council then directed administration to move forward with looking at costs so that we could implement uh, potentially those costs into budget, which we did in 18 and put into budget for 19 to at least start a study as to uh, what that would entail. In 2019, when we looked at capital budget, uh, Council again directed administration to move forward with, at the very least, looking at what options are out there and in that case coming up with a final proposed treatment system feasibility study cost and timeline for construction so the reason we're here today is to present to the committee such that then they're able to provide us with uh, again guidance and consensus moving forward come budget deliberations here in December as to uh, the proposed direction potentially so first thing, again, we looked at um, what treatment systems are available out there that would adequately uh, handle the uh, amount of uh, wastewater that would come into our system. It was decided upon that Leslieville would be the ideal location where our current lagoon is situated. And to expand upon that, current lagoon in terms of a treatment system that has the ability again to deal with external hauling along with the potential future of tying in Condor, Withrow, Alhambra and of course uh, Leslieville, Leslieville being initially. So the two systems that were, were brought to our attention where these feasibility studies were done was what we call a membrane biological reactor mechanical treatment facility designated as option A. And then the other one was a source-to-source -source wastewater kidney, kidney treatment facility. Uh, first one being proposed and presented to us by MPE Engineering Limited and the second one by Magna Engineering Services Incorporated. Mm -hmm. Now I want to just clarify here with, with Council that uh, there are many treatment systems out there and one of the studies that needs to be submitted to Alberta Environment Parks is what we call a receiving water body assessment. Once Alberta Environment Parks has a chance to review this receiving water body assessment, um, they have a pretty good idea of what it is that they need to see to uh, meet the requirements so that uh, you have appropriate um, wastewater essentially into your receiving stream. So in this case, they looked at both Lobstick Creek and Last Hill Creek. So the Lesserville Lagoon currently discharges into Lobstick Creek and the Condor one discharges into Last Hill. So once they received that water body assessment, they came to the conclusion that there was only two systems that they felt that they could approve to meet all the requirements. And these are the two systems that you currently have in front of you. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that, too, is the option A, the membrane biological reactor, is a very common system. Okay? It's seen throughout Canada, North America, and such. The second one, option B, is not as common. As I wrote out there, um, it's more common in Europe. There's over 4,000 sites that have this type of system in place. But interestingly enough, it is also uh, seen up north. And I made reference to, um, to some of the uh, places in, in the northern community, uh, communities that uh, currently have this type of system in place. So the interesting thing about this, without going into great detail, is in essence it's a wetland uh, system. Okay? So it, uh, it incorporates the functioning of what a wetland does as well, and it has that look all right, to it. Um, so I wanted to make mention of that because uh, there are um, people see that as, as somewhat 
suspect possibly, but it is a system that is approved by Alberta Environment Parks. So we wanted to think outside of the box as to uh, things to consider, potential options to consider. Okay. So if we look at option A, the um, with the uh, membrane mechanical treatment facility, and again, I just want to emphasize this too in regards to these systems. Neither Kate or I are subject matter experts in regards to these systems. We know what it is that they do and have a general 10,000 foot view as to how the system in itself works. And I'm more than happy just to give you that 10,000 foot view. But uh, in terms of greater detail, uh, like I said, we're not subject matter experts. And if council feels they want to know a little bit more or more detail associated with either one of these systems, please provide us direction in that way and we'd be more than happy to uh, bring one or both of the uh, engineering firms in and they can provide you a more intimate detail in terms of the system itself. Okay? But we were directed by council to uh, come up with some options if that indeed is the route that council wants to continue to move forward with is having a regional wastewater system. Uh, so option A again, the membrane biological reactor. Um, and of course, has a number of components associated with that. Now, the projected costs are as follows. So the capital cost of the system for phase one, so I indicated that's Lesseville and any external haul-in coming into that system is 10.5 million. The phase two, whereby we then have the opportunity to tie in the hamlets of Alhambra, Withrow, and Condor is an additional 1.6 million. So we have to expand that facility, but more so bring some additional um, equipment in to allow for that expansion to occur, but that's 1.6 million. Now, something to note as well is both these systems does not require an expansion of the site itself. Okay, so what's there now, the land we have available to us in regards to the uh, Lesley Lagoon is more than adequate to, to uh, handle either one of these systems. The uh, operation maintenance costs, we're looking at approximately 250,000 per year to uh, operate this type of facility. If council so wishes, and this was the direction they wanted to go, and to move forward with the regional wastewater uh, system, uh, and to start in 2021, we're looking at approximately 3.545 million in 2021. Uh, 2022 would be phase one construction at 5.85 million. And then if council so chooses to move forward with the phase two, for future needs in regards to uh, tying in the remaining hamlets, then that's an additional uh, 2.8 million as well. That could be done in 2023 and finishing off in 2024. This system would be able, up and running, summer of 2023. Okay. Now the second one, um, is, again, I've pointed out some of the uh, various um, uh, equipment associated with this. So the projected costs are as follows. Phase one, again, trying to keep apples to apples here in regards to bringing online Lesseville and the uh, external hauling is 6.5 million. And then phase two is 1.5 million. And again, just to emphasize that allows us the opportunity to tie in Alhambra with Rome Condor. I now also made note that you'll notice optional waste to energy equipment for biosolids management. And yes, you read that co correctly, that's waste to energy. So that's essentially taking the sludge, the, the sludge, <laughs> and reusing it. It gets into this, into waste to energy, and that then um, uh, converts it to energy and can actually be tied back into the system so it supplies its own energy needs. Or well, the other option is that sludge is collected and then hauled away for disposal to landfill. And that is actually the method used for the membrane biological reactor as well, is that sludge is hauled away for uh, processing either to another facility or it can be hauled to the landfill as well. So having said that, the need to desludge is basically eliminated. Okay? And if there was the case to desludge, that would be would be a very, very long time before we would even consider that, but it shouldn't need to be desludged. Uh, the, uh, the cell where the final water is stored and then prior to release to our receiving streams. So in terms of construction schedule itself, we're looking at um, if we were to start January, so January 2021 to 20, 
June 2021 um, would be some final design to the system, uh, finish off the regulatory approvals, and then we would go for tendering with the intent to have it constructed uh, prior to the winter season, if all goes well. Otherwise, it would carry over into 2022 with commissioning of the facility at the latest 2022, potentially the summer of 2022. Okay. So option B then would have a cost of eight million dollars. That is correct. Yeah. And option A has a cost of 10.5 plus the uh, 1. additional 1.6, or just under okay. 12 million. Correct. Now, in that. For option B, we have the cost to accommodate phase two is 1.5 million, mm -hmm. but then the cost in option one is 1.6. Is that just a different, is that a typo or? No, nope, we're putting that's a just, pipeline it's to this. just uh, um, the facility itself requires less because that also okay. incorporates whatever additional equipment is needed in phase two at the site itself. So there isn't quite as expensive in regards to that additional equipment at the site. Now, are there any of the wastewater kidney treatment facilities operational in Canada? Yes, there are currently. No, I didn't uh, provide that. I need to find it here. Yes, if you look at uh, the um, last page of the write up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and section uh, part B. The kidney system is considered a lined wetland treatment system and, as such, is practically indistinguishable from the natural environment. Uh, the treatment is almost entirely underground. Also, wastewater kidney is presented here is not yet operating in Alberta, but worldwide. Uh, there are communities using similar engineered wetlands, over 4,000 in Europe alone. Nevertheless, wetlands for wastewater treatment have been studied and implemented in northern Canadian communities such as Palulatuk, I believe it's Palulatuk, Chesterfield Inlet, and Stephenville, Newfoundland. So they do use that system. So if we wanted, if we were inclined to go towards option B, we could reach out to those communities and get information on them, how happy they are with the system. Sure. Yep. And, and we'd be more than happy to do that. Yes. Okay. Any other questions on option A or option B at this time? Councillor Lang. So earlier this year we had presentations from, I can't remember what they're called, but they produced that either the fluff or, or bile or fuels um, from waste. And the one, the one company, they can turn septic, septic waste into energy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, have you heard anything about that? Or um, I'm, just, I'm just thinking, you know, if there's a possibility where we could turn all kinds of waste into energy, that might make more sense going into the future. And also, Sylvan is doing something similar. I don't think it's up and going yet, but I'm just kind of wondering if we shouldn't wait to see what happens with them first. I don't know if they're using septic waste, though, to turn into energy. Um, but I know there was talks about that. Um, as far as I know, to this point in time, and I haven't done any further research in regards to the Sylvan Lake one, the last I heard it was still in approval stages, uh, but again, I'd have to check to get a more up-to-date one. I do not believe, Councillor Lang, they use uh, uh, waste in the sense of uh, wastewater to, to, uh, in their facility or, or uh, if that's part of their approval process. Now, interestingly enough, you, you indicated is there the potential or possibility if we go to waste to energy, excuse me, at this site to use more than just the waste associated with wastewater. And yes, that is the potential there. What we did here was just to include the cost of that, if the facility in of itself was just to take care of the, the uh, waste associated with wastewater. So we'd have to look into what additional means uh, would be required in that piece of equipment itself to, to go beyond that. Yeah. Councillor Laird. Yes, uh, earlier in your presentation you indicated uh, a couple things and I just want to confirm uh, or reaffirm what I think I understood. So you indicated that there would be no need to expand the current area or footprint that we already have in land mass. Is that what I That understood? is correct. Okay, yes. and that's in both these scenarios? Both. Yes. Okay, so yay. <laughs> that means we're not buying more land. No. Okay. The that second, would be Eric. Pardon me? That would be Mr. Uh, Hansen. Oh, fair enough. 
just to make sure the arrows go in the right direction. Okay, perfect. Um, the desludging you said would almost be totally eliminated. How much are we paying? Like, how often are we desludging, and how uh, both Condor and Leslieville because it would impact both. And um, how much would we potentially be saving that we no longer would have to spend on desludging? Like, I'll take that one. Um, so we desludged Condor recently for the upgrades, and the cost was approximately four hundred thousand. We put that in our operational budget for every five years. So the last time Leslieville was done was 2013. So it is very due. Okay, so it's getting close to needing done then. Correct. Um, like we were kind of wanting, yeah. It's overdue. So effectively, if I were going to make round numbers, recognizing it could be close to a million dollars every every five years. Yes, between the two of them. Correct. And we'd be eliminating that cost. That's correct. Yes. Okay. That that helps me understand the cost benefit. The other part that I, I guess remind council and and because of course it impacts one of the hamlets in my area, and that's Withrow is still looking for a solution, and that certainly provides a very viable solution to a community that has been faced with this challenge. And I, it's my understanding they've come to previous councils looking for solutions, and this would provide that solution as well, quite nicely by the looks of it. Um, so I'm grateful for that to be put forward as well. Councillor Duncan. Um, but this doesn't include lines that would tie in those communities, like with row to the system, does it? The, on option A, um, no, the 1.6 million in that sense is just the, just the upgrade the to, upgrade to the still facility. have a large bill to tie in these communities with the pipelines themselves, Correct. which is where the, okay. and the station the holdup with Withrow has been over the years because they've not accepted the cost that would be borne by the residents themselves on that, which we'd have to work out in this case as well. But um, the other, okay, and the other question is, and I think we talked about this a year or two ago too, was that the cost of actually not doing any of this but piping it all to a new facility in Rocky Mountain House is more than the cost of these, from what I remember? Yes, it's substantially more. Um, we were talking about that facility and potentially tying in Rocky Mountain House and Caroline and the facility itself, and we were looking at potentially up to 110 million to to do that. So, yeah, yeah. And further to the, you mentioned uh, Councillor Duncan in regards to the bringing in the Condor, Alhambra, and Withrow. I did mention that as well in the. Uh, and then thank you for pointing that out uh, in the additional items for consideration uh, C. Condor would be an additional four million in terms of the piping to tie that in. Alhambra six million and Withrow seven million. So that would be from Withrow to Condor seven million, Condor to Leslieville an additional four and then Alhambra six to go from Alhambra to Leslieville. Correct. Okay, because it's not three from Withrow to Condor? Yeah, I'm going to have to relook at that. That's awfully high. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, my apologies. I will look okay. at that because I recall the, uh, when we looked at the Withrow, tying Withrow initially into Leslieville, it was 3.7 million total, including upgrades to the Leslieville facility. I believe that was the number. So, okay. so at that time, I believe it was approximately 1.8 million for the upgrades. So you're right, so probably another uh, uh, two million, two and a half million f to tie in the line. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for pointing that out. Sorry. Do you nope. mind? It's quite all right. I went over. Point two is it like it's a direct line from Withrow to Lesterville, and then you know maybe you can splice Condor and Humber together first or something. But um, yeah, but there are other costs here too. So we're up into the uh, if it's you know all all in here at another. 10 or 12, so we're looking somewhere 16 to 18 million, right, to get to have this, all those hamlets tied in. Councillor Laird. Um, yes, and thank you for clarifying that, uh, Councillor Duncan, that there'd be additional costs for uh, pipelines and per perhaps lift stations. Um, 
which could be phased in over a number of years in the future for sure. Um, looking at this, the, you know, I, th I think the biggest check, check mark in this box for me is we are currently non-compliant. Yes. And yes, we are, haven't been, you know, we haven't been written up yet. I think that the I think the world and the community is moving more and more towards compliance and uh, and uh, environmental stewardship because that's what this really plays on and I think that we need to take this very seriously. The other part that I am very pleased about is I'm recognizing that we are going to go through a negotiation process with the town um, in the very near future with regard to. How do we continue to have access and uh, and how we co-fund uh, this other facility, uh, Lagoon and, and whatnot for the town? I like having the other option of a facility that uh, we can use on the east side of the uh, county um, for septage to be taken to. It gives us an alternate for uh, shorter haul routes for where the majority of our, our mm. people live. Um, in, in rural, uh, in our rural lifestyle. So I, I, I like the idea of having a second option. I like having um, that backup plan. And if I may, as Councilor pointed out, um, very good point in that the presently less of a lagoon is, does not meet or is compliant with Alberta Environment Parks. So I did point that out as well in Part E of additional items for concern. So if and when that does happen, and this is a matter of time, right now to upgrade the system very much like the upgrades which were completed at the Condor Lagoon, the co cost associated with this endeavor would be estimated at $2.5 million. Deputy Reeves Swanson. I'm, uh, what, what caught me or caught my eye in, in a lot of this is the waste energy uh, in, the, in, in the plan or the, the Magna has presented because I do believe in the future our electricity is going to be more expensive. So any way that we can reduce uh, any utility expenses um, by managing our own sludge, that would be, <laughs> uh, I see that as a huge benefit. And... Um, just as going to Councillor Lang's comment about uh, Sylvan Lake, I do believe at the last Red Deer, uh, Red Deer River Municipal Users Group, um, the councillor from Sylvan Lake said that that particular project is on the shelf. Um, they went and did some exploratory, but they had spent, uh, what was it, $10 million doing a, connecting all the summer villages and having that one conduit, uh, the, wastewater. the wastewater that's all along 11A. So that became a priority versus the waste energy. So with that, um, so it doesn't mean that they're not going forward with it. It's just been put on the shelf at this time. So, but there is, with every year, there's more and more technology that's coming out in that field of waste energy and listening to the village of Caroline's last meeting uh, Mayor Rimmer did make the mention that they were getting a business plan put in front of them for their waste energy exploration as well so um, to me it's it's we're going to see more and more of that and uh, and I like us if that particular system can be expanded on in the future that would be you know, to just not to have things duplicate, as Councillor Vandermeer referred to before in a previous subject, that, you know, the system is can be built upon and do more with the system. Councillor Duncan. That was where I was going a little bit. It's too, these proposals here before us, do we have to pick a size on these, or can we, like, do we have to plan for future growth on these systems, or can we wait on that these are set up to account for the future growth for future growth, future as, well. growth as well um, yes do you have a pre like 20 percent population growth or something or oh. um i'd have to look i can get back to you on that uh, okay. Councilor Duncan, as to what these study indicate and I, what as far as i know mechanical systems generally you can increase their size way easier than increasing the size of lagoons and, and that sort of thing yes that's yeah. correct yeah and for both these systems that ability is there to to uh 
um, to account for additional growth. Okay. And, uh, and the footprint is still there. We would not have to buy additional land to account for that. Thank you. Councillor Lang. I'm just wondering, how would the province look upon this putting in a, a larger system there in Leslieville um, as far as getting grants? Would they look at it as duplication? I know we were looking at another area earlier and the province did not look upon that favorably, so I'm just wondering about this one. Um, again, good point, good question, uh, Councillor Lang. In Part D, I did uh, take that into consideration in regards to the funding. So there are numerous opportunities for funding for this. And um, I've listed them there again, Alberta Water and Wastewater Partnership Program, Alberta Water for Life Program, Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, Federation of Canadian Municipalities and Green Municipal Capital Funding, and the Alberta Municipal Stimulus Program. Now, further to that, you had indicated about uh, duplication. So I'll lead into this part um, in terms of course of action number two. So as all of you saw in last week's paper, I believe it was, or a couple of, I believe it was September 1st edition, and this is mentioned in course of action number two, the town was granted a $10.8 million, and that was from the ICIP grant, to um, upgrade their facility. And um, you'll notice they refer to it as the regional system. Right. So I did not have an opportunity or Kate to look at what their application looked like or the wording they put in there, you know, in regards to expanding upon their definition of regional. Um, but we can only speculate that they, I'm sure they included Clearwater County in that uh, application process. So keeping that in mind here, um, that takes us to course of action number two. As you can see, in the uh, Lagoon Agreement with the town, we have to give notification um, as of the, uh, I believe it's October 14th, 2021, as to whether or not we want to continue with that agreement or an agreement. So next year, about a month from now, from this date, we have to provide uh, a letter or some form of notice to to the town of Rocky Mountain House whether we wish to continue. And we all know that uh, according to that agreement as pointed out in section 8.1 and 8.2 of the agreement that, that uh, we will in all likelihood then be asked for additional funding to make up for the difference from any grants that may have been given. And I pointed that out as um, A and B. No further grants will be obtained, thus we'll leave approximately 16.2 million remaining to be funded to the town. Or B, an additional matching 10.8 million provincial grant is funded or is provided, leaving approximately 5.4 million remaining to be funded. Okay. So I guess worst case scenario is a 16.2. So if we remain in agreement, we all know that that we will, Clearwater County will have to financially contribute to the capital of this if, uh, if we carry on with the agreement. So we have a copy of the Regional Wastewater Treatment Facility Upgrade Feasibility Study. Yep. But we do not have a copy of their grant application or the successful grant that explains that $10.8 million. That's correct. Thank you. Councillor Vandermeer? Uh, just in reading the uh, press release on this, uh, the last sentence says, uh, only once the above are completed would the town proceed with engineering, tendering and construction. So clearly the town uh, is, uh, is targeting very clearly to get the 10.89 from the province so that the net is down into the five category and that, of course, uh, makes a huge difference on uh, the town and potentially on ourselves, right? So, uh, 
yeah, that the target is uh, is a worthy one regionally. That uh, that you pull in uh, almost twenty two million dollars of grants. So it will it would be very interesting to receive more detail than than we have at this point. And as, I'm sorry, as I pointed out, that's something that needs to be considered here is is uh, to. Uh, account for this and what's happening there and again we're in a current agreement with them and uh, just to put that out there let's say play it out and they receive that additional provincial grant that puts it down to approximately 5.4 million keeping in mind we still need to upgrade at some time in the future the Leslieville Lagoon and that's probably another two and a half million right so many things to consider as a committee and as a, as a council in providing us direction uh, for the next uh, five-year capital plan. Councillor Lang. You know what, um, as I think about this regional system and um, the Rocky L Lagoon, they, they are calling it a regional system. In a sense, Leslieville could be called that too because external haulers come, come in from Mount View County, Lacombe County, they come in from all over. So in a sense, it's a regional system as well. And I'm just thinking that may help with the grant process applications. Most definitely, and that's how we would term it, um, if that's the direction this committee wants to provide us in terms of guidance, is definitely we would uh, reference it in that manner as a regional system uh, meeting the needs of Clearwater County and such. I think, and I'm, I'm, I'm I have just have Rick comment on this is the location might be such that that it might just take us far enough away from the Rocky Lagoon site that that might be to our benefit in terms of these grants to want to comment on that. Councillor Lyde. Uh, just a couple of questions around the uh, Rocky Wastewater um, Lagoon. We have no physical connection to that lagoon there is no lines running in from anywhere in the county no and it's my understanding that anything that would be county related there would be through a septage receiving station that is correct and if I recall right on the last re lagoon report we had we were around one and a half to three percent of the volume is is associated with that septage receiving station when we met um and it was in June, uh, Rick and I met with uh, our counterparts uh, with regards to how they were able to determine exactly what was, uh, they had a percentage, and I believe that percentage was 20%, if I remember correctly. And we sat down with them and challenged them on that, and the long short of it was they failed to recognize that, I believe there's seven of their subdivisions that currently are hauled in to the, uh, through VAC truck and such to the septic receiving station as well. They made the assumption that was entirely Clearwater County. So we challenged them on that and challenged them uh, further as to how they assumed it was 20%. And the key word, they made that assumption. They just assumed. So what we did then was we asked that the, these calculations be redone, uh, accounting for their seven and I believe it's 61 subdivisions that we have, okay, that could potentially, accounting for the fact that um, the one uh, west of us, um, campground, what is it? Rick, uh, Wilderness. Yeah, Wilderness Village, okay, accounting for the, that one as well. So um, they said, fine, uh, we'd be glad to do that, and we'll come back with a more reasonable percentage in regards to, and, and with that percentage, they were basing it on on what was being received in the septage receiving station. And really what needs to be done is uh, uh, you need to look at the loading. So essentially the amount of solids that are coming in, that's a more accurate, accurate uh, reflection of what's coming in there. So I said, okay, and that was in June and we have not heard back from them since in regards to providing us with a percentage. So having said that, um, if this committee so directs us and as, as a council that you want to remain with the town that is obviously going to be a future discussion as to coming down to what that percentage will be because obviously that percentage will play a part in our contribution to the capital on, on whatever the remaining fund is. I hope that answers your 
question. Thank Councilor you. Yeah. Councillor Lang. If I could remember correctly at that meeting, not only did they forget about their own subdivisions, but they also assumed that all the residents of Clearwater County hauled to this station. That is correct. Because I know myself, I phoned the haulers. And there was only one hauler that I think it was 90% hauled. The rest hauled outside of uh, Clearwater County. So. And you're uh, absolutely and, correct. Yeah. That was another one right there that they failed to account for that. And well. I think they also assumed that a lot, most of this was solids, where um, it's mostly full containment now. Councillor Laird. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I guess I'm looking at this uh, report as being, I'll say, part two two parts to it. One part we have to look after uh, ensuring that we meet compliance and choose a path forward. And I'm actually quite excited about option B myself, um, just as a sidebar. And the second part is how do we support that other uh, the current system and, and and partnership we have with the town and their uh, lagoon system as they try to come into compliance because uh, we recognize they haven't been in the past and they still are not um, so they'll need to work on that and uh, we need to then figure out what percentage that truly is because currently when I read the agreement it appears to be silent on the percentage and I think we need empirical data to figure out what that really is, uh, including who's the haulers and who are they coming from and what is it are they hauling to, uh, to that center. Um, and we, we won't know the data of what's going outside. We don't know what we don't know. And I don't know that we could capture that. I guess then the third part, when I look at our system, I guess back to part A of this, um, puzzle we're putting together, the septage received in any of these, including ours, would then come with a fee for service, I assume, moving forward, that would be cost recovery. That is correct. We would set up a septage receiving station would be set up in such a way that uh, it very much like I would assume, and Kate's more the expert on this, is the, uh, the uh, water facility we have now in Nordic, the accounts were established, individuals that need to use that. We established account here, that's set up, and so I, I would assume that would be very much like that. And we would develop some way card system or something or counts so that we'd have empirical data on uh, uh, capturing that information. That is correct, yes. That would be very helpful uh, for us for as we move forward with uh, our options and hopefully then as we move forward with our partnership with the town, that that might be something that they would look at too as well as we figure out percentages and so forth. I think that would be helpful. Um, so I see this as two things right now. So just my thoughts. Um, I definitely support doing something about ours first and foremost because I certainly would think it would be really challenging to defend any dollars that we spend on somebody else's system when we're not ensuring ours is in compliance first. I think we can do both. I think we need to figure out a way forward though. The staff recommendation that the strategic planning committee provide guidance and consensus for administration on the possible course of action for Clearwater County Regional Wastewater Treatment Facility. So we're looking for either option an option, possible course of action number one, we're looking for which one we would choose, option A and option B. And then how do we want to move forward with possible course of action number two? That's the yeah, information. So I'm going to make the assumption if you move forward with course of action number one, we would let the town know prior to October 14th, uh, 2021, that we will no longer uh, uh, continue on with the agreement so it's a two-year notice so the agreement ends October 15 2023 and we have to provide a two-year notice so we still have and that's why we made it 
we were absolutely clear in terms of working with our engineers that a system has to be up and running by no later than the summer of 2023, knowing we're out of there if that's the route council chooses to go. We're no longer with the town as of October 15th, 2023. What do you mean by out of there? Because so, could not an independent hauler still use the town facility even if we as a county are not in an agreement with the town? Yeah. Mr. Ammons? I think what uh, Mr. Magnus is communicating is the importance of having a facility that can accommodate Clearwater County. I would suggest that it would be in Clearwater County's best interest to try and navigate a new agreement with the town of Rocky. Um, they're an important partnership when it comes to wastewater. Um, Wilderness Village is a large user and uh, definitely a business in Clearwater County. Um, so it serves our residents well. Um, and we are a client and the interest would be to maintain that relationship um, however we do think it's prudent that we also have a facility that can accommodate um, Clearwater County as a whole but especially the residents to the east that currently go to Eckville or uh, as far away as Sylvan to hit the regional system that goes into Red Deer um, and provide for our own as well um, so I, I think if that communications and in that way then we're potentially looking at a course of action number three in that we can tarry, carry on as pointed out by uh, uh, Rick here uh, in, in working to put together an agreement beyond 2023 and move forward with our own facility as well at the current Lesterville site so there is no deadline well, I'll go back. You had mentioned that we will have upgrades at the Leslieville Lagoon, no matter what, of about $2.5 million. And is there a timeline, or is that just when the provincial government says we have to? When we have to. Okay. Yeah. So that is on the books somewhere in the future, no matter what? Correct. Okay. We, I currently put it 10 years ahead in our capital, so I just sort of bump it every year. And, of course, when it comes to us, if the province, if and when the province does it, then we'll bump it accordingly. But it is in our 10-year capital. It's always shown in our 10-year capital. So even if we go forward with possible action number two, we still have that 2.5 million, unless we close down the lagoon, which we would never do. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Council direction. Councillor Laird. Yeah, I had a, had a number of things that kind of came up in that, uh, and I do like the option of making sure that we um, maintain an, a, a, a partnership with the town as well. I think that's important. Um, given that we likely have to, uh, and I guess I have to, for me, break it into pieces uh, just to keep it a little simpler, I'd be uh, happy to make the motion that we move forward with option B, uh, in our uh, capital planning for the Lesleville area. Um, and then I, I think we'd have subsequent motions for what we need to th consider on action number two and keeping up uh, our partnership with the town. So I think for me, I need it in bite-sized pieces. So if I'm I may, that's clear. Council Laird. <laughs> Yeah. You know, um, uh, so our understanding is to continue to move forward with an agreement with the town. So um, come 2023, uh, a negotiations will occur with the town in regards to moving forward with that agreement, knowing full well that, and I'm just putting this to council to, con to keep this in consideration, that any upgrades to that lagoon, town Lagoon, which they're potentially looking at 27 million for the system they're going to put in place, some of that onus will come back to us as well. So a percentage, yes. Yeah, yes. And as long uh, as we're all comfortable with that, I just want to be clear. If on I that. may, uh, yes, through the chair. Okay. My expectation is that we would be paying a percentage of that based on a negotiated uh, discussion that we would have mm -hmm. on use, uh, that sort of thing, with empirical data that they'd probably be able to provide to us. I'm quite confident in that. 
in the meantime, uh, and I guess my motion as I break up these into more bite-sized pieces for at least me, is my motion is first and foremost uh, that we deal with our, our facility and um, that option B be, uh, be explored as part of, uh, as presented here and in the timelines, which will help, I think, facilitate the other conversations as we move forward. And it'll achieve making sure that we come into compliance uh, with the um, provincial and federal regulations. So that's my first, uh, that's one, op uh, one motion. Uh, just let's deal with one piece. Okay, I think we need to uh, maybe tighten up that motion a little bit. Okay. So it's more clear for I did ramble. The administration. I so you're you're asking out of option under possible course course of action number one, you're asking that administration investigate option number B. Option letter B. And then we will discuss the possible course of action number two. Admin will gather all the information and then we at a future date will decide which course of action. Yes. Okay. So can we, how is that motion? Well, let, Cammie gave a motion, let's define the motion and then we'll get back to other councillors. While they're working on that, Councillor Vandermeer? Yeah, um, just a uh, couple points. Uh, just wait, John, we need your microphone turned on so the lodge team can hear you. Thank you, Murray. Uh, just a couple of points. Um, the, the effort by the town of Rocky Mountain House to obtain a grant for a regional system uh, makes their facility very attractive uh, if they're successful, particularly in getting the other leg of that grant. So, um, in fact, if they got the other leg of that grant, uh, another uh, facility, even at Leslieville, uh, would not be able to compete with that unless you get a grant. You could haul quite a long distance for the difference to, in, in processing, I'm sure. So I think it's important that administration uh, get about applying for a grant for a regional system because 75% funding is what's needed to make these things go and it's historically what uh, is achievable. So I think that's really, you know, if you, you can choose uh, the kidney system here. Uh, option B, whatever, whichever one you like. It's the one proposed. I like it fine. Um, I think you need to apply for a grant. And that's the first step. And then we have time to sort out these things uh, with, uh, with Rocky Mountain House. And then we will know better what we can do. Do we have the motion? Or do you need another minute? Not trying to put anyone on the hot seat there. Okay, thank you, Repoven. Sorry, thank you for your patience. <laughs> um, so, what I have is that the committee recommends that council consider option B, source to source wastewater kidney treatment facility for 2021 budget. And then for the second one, I just needed a little bit of clarification. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you wanted administration to gather information. Four, sorry, I just missed the last half of that. Um, just looking for you to gather more information on uh, how we move forward with that partnership and discussion with the town, uh, with their uh, with their lagoon and um, their proposal as well, and and our agreement. I guess that's kind of all wrapped in one. Sorry, it's not as clear as. Yeah, I would prefer that that would be a second. Yes. Uh, second motion, um, but the first motion is dealing with our regional system. A yes. question for administration, does that get confusing if we have a motion to go forward with one option and then another motion to go with option two? Would you like it all wrapped up in one motion? 
Yep, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Revolven. Um, I think either is very achievable. Um, what I'm hearing is option B uh, with the intent to renegotiate a new agreement with the town of Rocky. That sounded much more elegant than I did, so thank you. Deputy Reeve Swanson. Uh, with a friendly amendment to add to that, that grants be applied for for option B. That would be applied for? That the grants be applied for for option B, as Councillor Vandermeer pointed out. Councillor Laird, are you okay with that amendment? Or is if, if I may, we, administration automatically would, uh, but to apply for any grants, um, you have to identify the type of system to be applicable. So this conversation was crucial. Um, we would automatically apply for every available grant. Just for further clarification, if I may, so is the intent of the committee in terms of the guidance provided to us that we, when we come forward for budget deliberations in December, that we show 2021-2022 the construction of B? Or do we wait a year, uh, start applying for the grants, I think the goal right now, the timeline right now, is that it be operational by October 2023. So you tell me how that fits in, that we have a, well, the less the bill upgrades would be completed by October 2023. My understanding now is that we're moving forward with, with renegotiating an agreement come 2023 with the town. So, so my understanding here is the intent is not to like um, basically you want to carry on. So there isn't, there isn't in essence a now definitive timeline here in regards to us getting something done by 2023. If, if I understand correctly that you still want to be, uh, negotiate with, with the town in regards to that agreement. Mr. Emmons? Thank you, Revolven. If I may, my understanding in the conversation is um, we are to proceed uh, as if the timeline did not accommodate for a successful renegotiation, but the goal and the hope is to achieve a renewed agreement with the Town of Rocky as well. But we do need to have a facility in play that could accommodate. That is my understanding. Do I see some, everyone's nodding their heads in agreement there? Councillor Vandermeer, you have a different idea? Yeah. I have a little different idea. Um, there's, there's a significant advantage in uh, negotiating for both parties, for the town and the county, in doing this negotiation for 2023. But also, the necessity of having another facility up and running by 2023 is not apparent, certainly not apparent to me. Uh, uh, there are many outlets at the present time, and as Reeve Hoven also pointed out, uh, even if we didn't have an agreement with the town, the uh, haulers uh, would probably be able to negotiate something to, to haul there. Um, we do have to do an upgrade at some point in time at Leslieville. I think we should do that, but it's, again, it's not clear. And I would make the point very similar to what was made in the announcement by uh, the town is that uh, they're not gonna go ahead and build this thing until they get the other part of that grant. And I think that's important that we take a similar stance at Leslieville. Uh, I mean, if it's, an, if it's a needed facility, and if uh, grants are normally forthcoming, and bear in mind that the federal government uh, has, uh, has, uh, has and will continue to announce many infrastructure uh, enhancements over the next few years, so um, I think it's important that we uh, not stampede into 2023. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a possibility. We don't have to make the decision for another year. Um, uh, I would certainly not recommend that we budget as though we're going to spend it in 2021. There's no need to do that in the first place. 
And secondly, it's, uh, it, it's limiting our negotiation. I think it's contingent upon grants, is the way I view it, in the same way that the town has made their investment in upgrading the facility here. Theirs is a much bigger facility serving a much bigger population in terms of actual usage, and um, they're, they're waiting until it gets properly funded. There's no need to step out and fund this thing 100%. Thank you. Councillor Lang. I have a question. So right now our, our, our external haulers can haul to Rocky. Can they haul to Condor right now? No. And they can't haul to Leslieville right now? No. So it's Rocky or Nordic? Yep, correct. Or outside of the municipality. Yep. Okay, so can we hear the motion again, please? Yes, thank you, Repoven. So I'll read them both. Um, the first one is that the committee recommends that council consider option B, source to source wastewater kidney treatment facility for 2021 budget. And then the second one, um, recommend renegotiating the town of Rocky Mountain House and Clearwater County sewage lagoon agreement prior to October, 2023. Do we? With the termination notice being two years, do we not have to have that renegotiated by October 2021? Right, and that's in the motion? Yes, I changed that. Okay. Yes. Okay, so we have the first motion to discuss, which is, I think, the key point right now, based on what Councillor Vandemer just said, is inclusion in the 2021 budget. So, discussion on the motion. Do we, Councillor Duncan. So, made just a bit of clarification. What We just have to have a decision made on what type of system in order to apply for grants. We don't have to have anything in budget, anything engineered at this point, right? Correct. What, what I'll do is, is, if that indeed is a consensus to go with option B, the source-to-source uh, -source kidney wastewater treatment facility, so come budget deliberations, what we'll put in the capital budget is these numbers presented here for 2021 onwards. And at that point, by all means, uh, Council can direct us if you want to move those numbers one uh, further down the year or whatever. We can do that. See, probably the earliest we could hear about a grant it's sometime in 2021, right? Like, yes. Uh, you know, awarding of that grant, like, the monies would never flow until 2022 or something like that. Especially if we have to, if we were trying to apply for a provincial and a federal leg to, to the grants. So, um, so it, it, I guess, either way works. You can have it in the budget for this year. We can just bump it down the road or, or not put it in the budget for this year, but apply for the grants and see what happens. Uh, I guess having it in budget gives us a little bit more flexibility if for whatever reason the grants come sooner than expected. That's my only thoughts there. Okay. Councillor Laird. Um, just a clarification, and, and this might be for Mr. Hagan. Um, we have dollars uh, already in reserve set aside for this project, do we not? We do, but I'd have to confirm the amount. Okay. Uh, um, perhaps that would be helpful uh, just for uh, just some background, because uh, I recognize whilst we are um, working through the process uh, of budgeting around that, it's, uh, I think, nice to know that from my, my last recollection, we have a number uh, of millions set aside for this project in capital. From what I last recall, I wouldn't be able to tell you how much it is, but so we, we're not starting from zero is what I'm saying. Uh, so we're we're well positioned to move this project along and still look for those grants uh, as a matter of course, which I believe is, as I said, a matter of course for staff uh, through the process. That's why I didn't add it to my, my motion. Grants are kind of, uh, you, you do it. Yeah, exactly. Further discussion on the motion, Councillor Vandenberg. Yeah, um, my, my recollection is that we had money in there as a holding, uh, 
holding spot for uh, upgrading wastewater, recognizing that there's a number of potential uh, projects. Uh, we need to do them when, when they are truly due. Um, and uh, the holding would have covered Rocky as well as this and maybe some other one that we know about in the future. So uh, again, um, if we're going to actually budget anything, I'd recommend that the actual budgeting be done around the 25% of whatever project we ultimately define and um, put such that very much like I think Rocky Mountain House did it the right way. They said, look, uh, we're applying for a grant, and if we get grants, we're going to build this thing. Uh, there's no need to build this un until some later date. We can wait for grants, and the smart uh, municipalities will do that. They will wait for grants. Okay, seeing no lights on, I'm going to ask the question on motion number one. Can you read it back one more time so everyone understands? Thank you. Um, the committee recommends that council consider option B, source to source wastewater kidney treatment facility for 2021 budget. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? I think I'm opposed if that includes the full amount. Uh, I would only budget 25%. Okay. Well, then, Murray. Eric. Murray. What I'd suggest is that we need to budget the entire amount as a capital expenditure offset by a budgeted capital revenue amount of the 75%, which would net to the 25%. Councillor Randomly referred to. Well, the motion uh, was carried by a six to one vote with Councillor Vandermeer posing. So we're, the motion carries. I don't know if Councillor Vandermeer can change his vote, probably not, but the motion carried. So option, or the second motion. And Councillor Laird, are you making this motion as well? This button, uh, I can, uh, I just, through the process of the conversation, I just wanted to ensure that we haven't forgotten that we have a partnership that is with the town with regard to the use and access of that uh, facility for uh, uh, the lagoon use and access. So I, I just didn't want to see that lost in this discussion. I think it's important. I think that the discussion about what that empirical data looks like that creates the percentage because it it's silent in the current agreement and I think that's been one of our biggest stumbling blocks um, and uh, the various roles of how we move this thing forward. Uh, I think that, that and I, that's why I wanted it in two pieces. This is an important facility that a lot of, I will say anybody in and around the Rocky uh, Mountain House area use this facility, they use it. So I think it's important that we are partnered in that facility and that continues. So yes, I can make that motion that we would continue to, I, I think you probably worded it much more elegantly than I have, but that we would uh, enter into negotiations with regard to facility access and use um, moving forward. Can we hear the motion? Yes, thank you. Um, so, Councillor Laird, um, Councillor Kemi Laird, that the committee recommend renegotiating the Town of Rocky Mountain House and Clearwater County Sewage Lagoon Agreement prior to October 2021. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion carries 7 to 0. Anything else on this topic, administration? No. Thank you very much. Mr. Hagan. Thank you, Reeve. Uh, Councillor Laird, to answer your question as to the reserves, according to our 2019 financial statements, uh, the sewer reserve balance was just over $8.5 million, and specifically the Leslieville sewer reserve was approximately $91,000. What I don't have here are any of the commitments that uh, we already have 
uh, recorded against those reserves. Those are the gross reserve balances that are outstanding or available. Thank you. Councillor Lang. Question for Mr. Hagen. Is the 91000 with the Leslieville um, Lagoon over and above the 8.1? Yes, it is. Yeah, they're separately identified in our financial statements. Thank you. We will move on to item 7.1, revised council board and committee re remuneration policy. Mr. Emmons. Is it true that they say the best of the last then? Here we are again discussing uh, council remuneration. Um, so um, originally we had uh, talked about this for a while and it was going to come as part of um, one of your council meetings. But I know in discussion um, initially with Murray and then with Rick and um, so it was proposed that uh, it come before uh, the strategic planning um, discussion um, because of the impact again on operating costs and also a change in philosophy. So um, just some opening remarks. Um, initially I remember and it was more than a couple of years ago now uh, council had advised administration that it prefers to review its compensation and any recommendations well in advance of the election year. That it was not to be tied in the election year, but prior to. So that's why, again, this item has resurfaced. The county engaged a gross consultant to conduct a compensation and benefits review in 2019. And part of this review that he does conduct um, includes council compensation. Ed has presented his findings and recommendations to council at meetings held on September 10th, November 19th, and last on June 30th of this year. And one of the other aspects, just as a reminder, councils across the province were reviewing their compensation because of a change that Revenue Canada brought in which was to remove a third of the tax exemption. And that's why a number of municipalities and a number of councils at that time were taking a, seriously, a serious look at how they were going to offset that difference that the federal um, revenue agency brought in. So um, just to kind of fast track, when um, Ed was here for the presentation on June 30th, and these were the notes that I had taken at the time, um, that the consensus of council was to look at changing from an activity-based pay model to a combination of a salary-based plus activity-based model and that the process of engaging a council compensation committee was not effective nor efficient that exists in current policy and procedure and that also given the current economic conditions that council wished to review its rates based on the 50th percentile versus the 65th percentile and that such changes to the rate would be implemented over a two-year time frame. So, and Tracy Lynn, thank you for reminding me of this. So in addition to the change that you have here, just as the reminder, in um, bylaw number 1081-19, 
the council compensation committee is specifically mentioned in that bylaw. So if there's going to be um, looking at a change as to whether retaining or dissolving that committee, again, it's just the reminder that that bylaw will have to be re-examined as well. So I guess um, in terms of, I'm trying to keep it simple as Councillor Laird has talked about earlier, because that's also the way I like to kind of take a look at it. So I guess first of all is because we organizationally have split policy from procedure, the first aspect is to take a look and put policy with policy and then put the procedure as a procedure. And that would be um, quite efficient as it is because then that would be such an item as if council decided to change its um, annual rate in terms of a market adjustment rather than that entire process coming back to council it would be um, that council would notify administration that there needs to be change to the procedure which we could then update and then uh, provide to you with that change in rates uh, rather than bringing the entire thing back um, to to uh, council to uh, rule on. So the first part would be to actually take those aspects of policy and set it up as a policy itself. And then the second part of that would be um, to separate the remuneration details into a procedure. And then the third aspect, I guess, in terms of this discussion, and again, I understand everything's um, on the table. Um, we were also taking a look and um, thinking that perhaps what we should also further do in the procedure, which unfortunately I don't have before you, but I would take the existing sections that deal with board and committee and citizens at large um, and their compensation and set that up also as a separate procedure. And Murray promised he'd help me with all the math questions today. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think before you then, uh, we do have the draft of what we think should appear in the policy, uh, followed by uh, the strikeout again up for deliberation of the uh, Council Compensation Committee and then separating those aspects of remuneration into procedure, identifying what is meant by a salary rate, and also the per diem rate remains for specific um, activities that council deems, and then the balance of that procedure. Questions? or comments from Council? Councillor Duncan. Just a question. I'm not sure I quite understand the rationale for going policy and procedure. Wouldn't it be policy and appendix, or is that not a, because it's just to do with Council, this one? Now, procedures generally apply to administration. I, I know you're the guys that administer it, but it's, uh, I'm just trying to clarify how that works uh, in, you know, what's, what we should be doing in terms of legally setting this up, I guess. I guess, honestly... Um, it maybe doesn't matter, I don't know. I thought I was just following the same format we have in other areas and, and how we are looking at policy separated out from the procedure itself. Because right. the procedure is how we're going to carry out the policy. Right, but the procedure <coughs> procedure would be changed by, generally procedures are changed by administration. Okay, if, if I'm just trying to follow through, if we were, had to re-examine our rates after a number of years and wanted to increase or decrease them, 
council has the ability to go out of procedure as opposed to the policy with an appendix on it. That's what I was just. Correct. Okay. Councillor Lang. So if the procedure separated out from the policy, and I'm not, not speaking about the remuneration policy specifically, can, can council, do they have access to the procedures? Yes. Mr. Emmons? Truly not. Uh, procedures are administratively driven. It's how we carry out council's policy. If council doesn't agree with how your policy is being administered, then that should be reflected in the policy. Um, the procedure is a supplemental document to the policy. Policy is pol political. It's governance driven. And procedure is how we carry out your governance, how we physically put the boots to the ground. So if, uh, if the procedure isn't reflecting your intent of policy, then it's the policy that should be revisited, which would automatically require us to change the procedure. Yes. Sorry, now I'm confused. I believed on the website when you look at council policies that there is a separate folder, and I don't understand why the procedure just wouldn't be there as well any of the procedures that council had approved for themselves? That's not the question I heard Councillor Lang ask. Okay. My understanding of Councillor Lang's question was, can council uh, dabble in the procedures, for my words, I guess. My question was, can council view the procedures? Right. Can we go oh, online view. and look at the procedures? Oh, yes. Okay, I maybe wasn't <laughs> clear. But, yeah. So in terms of this policy then, we see the five principles on page 119 of 133. We approve those principles as policy and then we let admin decide among themselves how to best implement those principles and policy into procedures. Yeah. Councillor Derry. Um, thank you. Uh, and I remember when we first started discussing this, I think it was part of a workshop or uh, whatnot, um, you know, it's always a challenge when you start to talk about uh, paying yourself. It, it always seems, you know, counterintuitive to service to the community and especially when people are struggling um, themselves. And we, and we struggled as a group between what do we pay ourselves at the 50th percentile or the 65th and I see they're both kind of highlighted in here so I anticipate staff would like some direction or some you know from us as is it 50th or is it going to be 65th i know that as the rest of the um as we work uh through this we have put the um the staff at the 65th percentile um or endeavored to at least uh, that's been what we've directed um so I, I think we need to, number one, give some definitive direction on that. And if, if that's 50th or 65th, that conversation, as difficult as it is, needs to happen here. The other part of, the, of this is, at that time we had to look at, and that puts us into page 125 of 133, and it's the list of what's included in that base salary. And I went through looking, okay, what do I consider that is? And, I, you know, point one, regularly scheduled meetings, the strategic planning committee, annual organization meetings, those all make sense to be in there at the 50th. Same with the orientation and other orientation refreshers. Um, council workshops, I didn't necessarily think it belonged up in there. I thought it might be down in the per diem. Emergency management training just seemed like another type of training that is already down in the other area. Meetings with the CAO and our, and our directors, that I think is part of our job as well as preparing for council committees, boards, commissions, and advisory committees. 
and any other commitments that the council determines, I think belongs down in the per diem. Because that could be a little bit or that could be a lot depending on how busy the council decides to be. And what, uh, and what we're being, I would say, uh, asked in the community to move forward as part of our mandate from uh, what we're being told in the community. So uh, I just, maybe I was just looking at it too finite, which then brought me to the question of, okay, if that's a procedure, maybe it, maybe it more logically flows instead of a procedure, at least the listing of what all is included be as the appendix to this policy, and then how it's, how it's handled by staff is the procedure. So that was kind of a lot there, but okay. those were kind of what I was seeing in this. Other comments? Let's. The staff recommendation that the committee reviews and considers amendments to the council board and committee remuneration policy for strategic planning purposes as part of planning for operational operating costs for 2021 and provide recommendations to council. So perhaps the first question we can discuss is the, currently it is 65th percentile for staff, and this document shows a 50th percentile for council. Any comments on that? Mr. Councillor Duncan. That one's partially influenced by the per diem rates too, right? Because our per diem rates are as high or higher. I think I believe they were higher than most places, if not almost all of them out there. Yet, if we're in the, you know, we could be in the 50th percentile on our salary based, but a higher per diem rate will, you know, put your overall compensation near the same as everybody else's. So for me, there's, I would tend to fall in the 50th percentile just because our per, current per diem rates are, are probably well above the 65th percentile. Although, you know, we don't know exactly what other counties consider per diem and what they consider salary as well. They may be somewhat different than our interpretation of that. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, administration, but these numbers, the 50th percentile is based on total, right? Not the monthly and not the per diem separately. It's the total compensation. If I remember correctly, when Mr. Gross uh, analyzed our figures compared to other comparator organizations. I believe he gave us the ranking on, on each of the components separately um, and showed us where we were ranking from a salary perspective as opposed to a per diem perspective. But I do recall that council's discussion surrounded finding that balance and that blend. And my recollection, I think, was, was similar to Councillor Duncan's in terms of working towards um, a percentile ranking in total going forward and recognizing the components that fit into that. And I think that's where you truly find the comparability to the other organizations and get past that, well, are they salary-based, are they activity-based? At the end of the day, look at the overall payment to council members and how does that compare. So while we might be high on the per diem amounts for now, I think our direction would be to move towards raising up the salary numbers, holding the per diem numbers steady until we meet that target comparator that council is, is desirous of, of achieving. Okay. Other councillor Lang. So I guess you're kind of want to know where we're all at with the 50th or the 65th well, percentile yes. and so as um, a balance I I think 50 50th percentile is very fair um, 
especially given the economic times. So many of our constituents are out of work. Um, there's, I know the 65th was to um, entice, attract, and retain employees. There doesn't seem to be a problem in attracting counselors. Most of us had competition in all our areas. And I don't believe a counselor should be in this for, for the remuneration. Having said that, I think we should be paid fairly. And 50th percentile, to me, is fair. Deputy Reeve Swanson. Uh, yeah, I like the 50th percentile as well, and I like the fact that it will be implemented over a two-year time frame. Uh, I, I like that it's a slow, slow build, and it helps establish, and it helps us monitor how things will be going forward. Um, in regards to just yeah, in the procedure, what uh, Councillor Ardford just went over, I guess I'm okay with leaving the council workshops up in the salary because I foresee that it's part of our... Um, in learning the projects, because it depends, it's project dependent. That's the way I look at these 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 uh, council workshops. So some of them, there may be years where we'll have 10, and there'll be years that there'll be one. So it's, I guess that's the way I look at it. So I'm okay in the salary, and it is what it is. It'll 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 change year over year on that and I think So it's just sooner keep it in the salary, and if it gets to be too much, then we move it into the per diem. Per diem. But, um, going forward because of the fact CRA and I know we have talked about it at the army level to the point that we've had a resolution about trying to lobby the federal government CRA into giving us back the one-third tax exemption <laughs> with no avail <laughs> and um, you know uh, going forward with that I mean it is it's not like we're working a nine-to-five job and 40 hours a week some weeks are much more and some weeks are much less but at the end of the day we are public servant and um, uh, this is uh, uh, th this is this is a very um, it, it's not a stable position because it moves the dial moves every four years and <laughs> so whoever sits in these seats every four years will be will be doing this so Again, 50th percentile over two years. I'm I'm fine with that. Other comments on the 50th percentile, Councillor Vandermeer. Comments made thus far. I'm happy with uh, what's proposed here at the 50th percentile. Anyone disagree with the 50th percentile? Everyone's comfortable. Okay, 50th percentile. Uh, there was some discussion on what should be included as salary and what work should be included on the per diem. We've got, we've had opposing viewpoints on the council workshops and emergency management training. On page 125 out of 133, are there any changes that we would like to see? Now, or when the numbers on the 50th, I have to get my thoughts together because it's going to be very confusing. Any comments on this before I speak? Councillor Laird. My reason for looking at what's on the list that fits in with the councillor base salary, we were one of the councils that chose not to just automatically give ourselves a one-third increase simply because the government scratched it away. We stood the course, we're having the conversation now. I don't want to see us, based on this 50th percentile and the workload, end up getting even further behind. Because as I recall, when we started down this path, we were in the 16th percentile. And I don't want to see us in that position either. So I think we need to very seriously look at what is on the list recognizing we have chosen the 50th percentile, which I agree with. I just need to make sure that the workload then balances that and the rest falls into per diem. 
And that's why I've asked you to look at the list and say, now does that make sense based on the 50th? And I just think that training is training, so it falls into the per diem. Um, workshops, that could go either way, I agree. And uh, any other commitments, I think that falls in per diem. And hopefully that gives a little bit more understanding of why I went, uh, I've made this comment. I just don't want to see us for, fall further behind and have a greater workload. Mr. Hagan. Uh, just to add some additional clarification as well, uh, the reference to emergency management training um, within the top part of those definitions, if I recall correctly, I, I think that is like a one-day session at the beginning of Council's term. Um, I don't think it's an ongoing thing like other training might be, so just to clarify that. And it is legislated as well. Mr. Emmons. Rick. Thank you, Revolvin. The other thing I wouldn't mind pointing out for Council's consideration um, is the burden this also lifts off of administration. Um, respecting Council's consensus on the 50th, um, fundamentally, I, I truly believe we move, move forward as an organization. We are one team. Um, we do administer your governance. Again, fundamentally, I, I'm a proponent of the 65th. I do believe we're all on the same team. Um, behind that also is streamlining what this does to administration. Um, the current system is very burdensome on payroll and adds a lot of workload. And by perhaps going to 65th and making it a little more inclusive of what it does, it takes a lot off administration as well. Um, and I'm not sure if council's aware of that. Um, there, there is a savings there, so. Thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Lahid. Just a comment kind of further to Councillor Laird. Um, I do, I do agree with the 50% level. However, I think we will see an initial reduction in remuneration for that first time period because there is more included that's outside of the per diem type rate then. So I think as long as we reckon, and I certainly have no problem uh, conveying that to our rate payers that we've actually seen a, a lowering even though we have a increase in the, um, in the, um, if the 50 percent type thing so anyways thank you deputy reeve swanson um well i can well appreciate uh, administration's point of view in regards to workload and your view in regards to the 65th um again um our rate pairs are in this economic environment are, are very studious in the dollars that our county or municipality spending. So um, should this be reviewed at going forward, which I expect it will be reviewed into the next term, those particular councils can look at that 65th at that particular point in time. So I'm ready to, I think, I think we all agree that 50th is, a, is the biggest jump at this point in time. Councillor Lang. Yeah, I concur with the uh, Michelle, I actually had my light on before you, but um, I realize it's more work for administration, but we owe it to our uh, ratepayers for transparency, and the only way we can do that is to mark down our individual meetings. Okay, so page 125 out of 133, council workshops, part of the salary or part of the per diem? I, I'm comfortable with the sheet the way it is. What do other councillors wish? Councillor Vandermeer. Comfortable 
as is. I'm seeing head nods. Cami? I made my recommendations. Okay. Councilor Lahey? Yeah, I guess I'm uncomfortable with what it is. Okay. So is there any other issues for this agenda item administration? I think every point that council has brought up has been dealt with. Have we missed anything? Okay. So it looks like the agenda has been fulfilled. Item eight, adjourned. Oh, or, looks like we did miss something. <laughs> yes. The compensation committee. Right. So we need a motion uh, recommending to council that we disband the council compensation committee. Councillor Duncan? Sure. I would make that motion. Uh, uh, administration bring back the bylaws to show the revisions to disband the, or to eliminate the co council compensation committee. Councillor Laird? Comments? I, 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 I noticed that administration may have some additional information that they might like to share with us. Okay, so we have a motion. Further discussion on the motion. Could we repeat the motion? The motion, please. Thank you, Repoven. It's a little rough. I will wordsmith it. That's fine. We're good with rough. <laughs> um, uh, so the committee recommends that council disband the councillor compensation committee. And bring back revisions to the bylaw to reflect. That's what I. <laughs> you don't know that one off the top of your head, Jim? <laughs> okay, may I also suggest that you um, approve the remuneration, recommend approval for the remuneration policy? Okay, we will do this motion for the committee and then we'll get another motion for that. Thank you, it's been a long day. So, further comments on the motion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries six to one. So we need to have a motion to recommend the Remuneration policy to council. Okay. Amendments as approved. Amendments as approved. Okay. So is there a councillor who would care to make that motion? And then we will get it read back to us so we know exactly what we're voting on. Councillor Vandermeer moves and we'll give admin a minute to put that together. Um, so I have that councillor John Vandermeer recommend. Or sorry, that the committee recommends the remuneration policy be approved as amended. Further discussion on that motion. All in favor? Motion carries seven to zero. And I believe that's everything now, administration. Okay, we'll move on to item eight, adjournment. Can I have someone please move adjournment? Councillor Duncan, all in favor? Carries. That ends the meeting. We'll see everyone 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs>